order. And without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Before I deliver my opening remarks, I wanted to note that today the committee is meeting virtually. This hearing will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. And before I deliver my opening remarks, I wanted to note that today the committee is meeting virtually. I want to announce a couple of reminders to members about the conduct of this hearing. First, members should keep their video feed on as long as they are present in the hearing. Members are responsible for their own microphones. Please also keep your microphones muted unless you are speaking. Finally, if members have documents they wish to submit to the record, please email them to the committee clerk whose email address was circulated prior to the meeting. Good morning and thank you to all of our witnesses for joining us here today. In April 2011, a tornado outbreak tore through Mississippi, Alabama and neighboring states. Over 300 lives were lost. This was despite an average lead time of over 20 minutes before the tornadoes arrived. What went wrong? The answer lies largely in the way risk was communicated to communities and how they responded. These tragedies spurred the National Weather Service to begin implementing its plan to build a weather ready nation. The vision was to make communities ready, responsive and resilient to such threats. Over eight years later, October, 2019, a tornado outbreak tore through the South Central USA. An EF3 tornado hit Dallas suburbs and became the costliest tornado in Texas history. However, unlike the tornadoes from 2011, there were no life-threatening injuries or deaths. While luck certainly played a role, the real difference was the ability of the weather service forecasters to communicate the risk so that communities could prepare. This is called Impact-Based Decision Support Services, or IDSS, is just one of the many improvements that have been made at the National Weather Service over the past decade. The Weather Service has built important relationships with its core partners. These include emergency managers, academia, the private sector, state and local and tribal governments. These partners work hand in hand with weather service forecasters to provide the public with critical, actionable weather and climate information. Developments in science and technology are propelling us into the future of weather forecasting. Additionally, the weather service forecast accuracy has improved markedly. We owe much of this progress to our distinguished witnesses, Dr. Louis Usinelli. Dr. Usinelli will be retiring as director of the National Weather Service at the end of this year. He has served our country for 43 years. For the past 32 years, he has been at the National Weather Service and for the past nine years, he has served as its director. He has had an impressive career. Whoever succeeds him as director will have very large shoes to fill. But despite the successes of the weather service under his tenure, there's still work to be done. Over the past decade, there have been numerous external reviews of weather service workforce and operations. Each report outlined areas of improvement and growth and some issued recommendations. 
we will discuss some of the recent government um, accountability office reports on the weather service today. I commend the weather service for its willingness to address the findings of these reports and continuously working to improve. World-class scientists are the beating heart of the weather service. However, over the past decade, there's been a high vacancy rate, especially among meteorologists. This has led to stress, fatigue, and reduced morale. The weather service has taken steps to address workforce issues, but more work must be done. I cannot emphasize enough that the committee would like to see these vacancies filled and they must be filled soon. Today, we'll discuss progress at the Weather Service and where there is still room for growth. We'll examine how to best position the Weather Service to provide robust IDSS across the country. And we'll discuss that what additional resources the Weather Service may need to ensure that we are truly weather ready nation. I hope today's hearing will serve as a roadmap for the next director of the National Weather Service. And I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. The chair now recognizes Mr. Lucas, a distinguished ranking member of the committee for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, for holding today's hearing. And thank you to all of our witnesses for offering your insight into our nation's weather forecasting future. As you know, improving our forecasting abilities and making our forecast even more useful has been a high priority for me as ranking member of this committee. And I appreciate Dr. Uccellini sharing his commitment and has dedicated his career at the National Weather Service to better serving the public. On a daily basis, the National Weather Service tools and services produce critical information to businesses across the country. Around this time of year in Oklahoma, NWS forecast alert farmers and ranchers to the first frost of the season helping us plan for weeks ahead. Towns and cities rely on forecasts to plan for inclement weather and forecasts issued by local weather offices provide life-saving information in the event of severe weather. In recent years, NWS has focused on efforts to become a weather ready nation. This was primarily done by implementing impact-based decision support services where the National Weather Service forecast offices provide forecast advice to local officials before and during a weather-related emergency. These efforts have improved communication to the public, helping families better understand the effects a weather event can have on them personally. Dr. Uccellini and the National Weather Service have also focused on the implementation of the National Blend of Models a method which improved the speed and accuracy at which meteorologists can issue alerts. By bringing together both the NWS and non-NWS numerical weather prediction data, an accurate, consistent model can be a starting point for forecasters across the nation. But despite the many successes of the National Weather Service, no government office is perfect and challenges always remain. At the forefront of my mind is how NOAA and NWS can more efficiently utilize and engage in commercial data buys to improve our nation's weather models. As made evident by the national blend of models, a US weather models cannot achieve their full capacities without the support of private weather enterprise. Another challenge we are facing is inspiring and training the next generation of STEM and meteorology students. Improving our models, data, and information won't help us if there are no professionals to utilize them in the next decade. That's why I'm pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Eric Solomon, Associate Director of Education and Outreach for the International Hurricane Research Center at Florida International University to the witness panel. As a weather-ready nation ambassador and someone who works closely with university students, he can offer a unique perspective on the future of forecasting in our nation, especially when it comes to engaging the community and the next generation workforce. Before I close, I want to thank Dr. Uccellini for his decades of service to the federal government. After a 43 year career in public service, 
He'll be retiring at the end of the new year, at the start of the new year, I should say. This change in leadership makes now an opportune time to reflect on the progress we've made and what challenges the National Weather Service should tackle next. I hope to use today's hearing to learn from all of our expert witnesses on what the next challenges might be. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Uh, if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. First, the esteemed Dr. Louis uh, Ossolini. Uh, Dr. Ossolini is the National o Oceanic Atmospheric Administrator's Assistant Administrator for Weather Services and Director of the National Weather Service. Uh, in this role, he is responsible for the day-to-day -day civilian weather operations for the United States, its territories, adjacent waters, and ocean areas. Prior to this position, he served as the Director of National Centers for Environmental Prediction, the NCEP, for 14 years. He was responsible for directing and planning the science, technology, and operations related to NCEP for nine centers. He was the Director of National Weather Service's Office of Meteorology from 1994 to 1999 chief of the National Weather Service's Meteorological Operations Division from 1989 to 1994, and section head for the mesoscale analysis and modeling section at the Goddard Space Flight Center's laboratory for atmospheres from 1978 to 1989. Our next witness is Mr. Cardell Johnson. Mr. Johnson is an acting director of GAO's um, Natural Resources and Environmental Team. He oversees work on the federal government's management uh, of public lands and water resources, including national parks and forests, mineral resources, coastal and marine resources, endangered species, water supply, and national services programs. Prior to joining GAO, Mr. Johnson served as the Director of Quality Assurance at USAID's Office of Inspector General, where he developed the organization's first quality assurance framework. He also worked at the EPA as a Senior Budget Analyst and Director of Performance Improvements in EPA's Office of Inspector General. Our third witness, Mr. John Werner, Mr. Warner is president of the National Weather Service Employee Organization, as well as a lead forecaster of the Weather Forecast Office, the WFO in Mobile, Alabama. He has served with the Niwi Old National President for the past two years, in addition to serving as lead forecaster of WFO Mobile, he also managed the Office of Hydrology Program and other program areas, including radar, marine, and aviation. Prior to joining the NWS, Mr. Warner served 24 years at a, as a meteorologist in the United States Air Force, where he held numerous positions, including the following. Chief of Weather Station Operations, the Air Force Special Operations Command, Directorate of, of Weather's Aerial Space Scientists and Chief Environmental Simulations Team at the Air Force Combat Climatology. Our final witness is Mr. Eric Selner. Is Mr. Uh, Jimenez here? Okay, well. That's about uh, it, Chair. Okay, would you like to introduce him? Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to uh, extend my war war warmest welcome to uh, Mr. Eric uh, Salna, the Associate Director of Education and Outreach for the Extreme Events Institute at the International Hurricane Research Center at Florida International University in Miami. FIU is a top tier uh, research university located 
in my district uh, in Miami, and that has over $237 million in annual research activity. Mr. Uh, Salnar personally has over 25 years experience as a broadcast meteorologist, uh, meteorologist providing live continuous coverage for hurricanes, tornadoes, and flooding. At FIU, Mr. Sano has focused on education and outreach that helps reduce the impact of natural hazard events. I had visited the uh, IHRC and seen firsthand their impressive research on storm surge, economic loss modeling, and wind engineering. In fact, their wall of wind is just one of the two NSF supported facilities dedicated to wind research. Mr. Sano is also a full member of the American Meteorological Society and the National a weather Association. He earned an MS in meteorology from Northern Illinois University and a BS in physical, in physical geography with an emphasis in meteorology from the University of Illinois. I look forward to hearing from Mr. Stalna and, uh, and how FIU can help assist federal agencies improve weather forecasting in not only in the near future, but also in the future for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Now, as our witnesses should know, you will have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. In your spoken testimony, we'll begin questions and each member will have five minutes to question the panel. We will start with Dr. Ussolini. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of this committee. It is my honor to testify before you today on the current status of and future opportunities for the National Weather Service. To say I have seen significant change at the Weather Service would be an understatement. I entered the National Weather Service Meteorological Operations Division in 1989. At that time, paper weather maps were still being used at the NWS operational centers. And at the center I came into, there was no digital capability. Fast forward to today, we operate in a completely digital environment, accessing data from the entire weather enterprise and providing advanced numerical prediction guidance from a seamless suite of model systems, ranging from short range forecasts to seasonal predictions, covering the domain from the sun to the sea. The National Weather Service meets its life and property saving missions through the provision of weather, water and climate services a mission statement that includes analysis, forecast warnings, and now impact-based decision support services delivered by our forecasters from Guam, the Southwest Pacific Island states to the middle, middle Atlantic Ocean, and from Alaska to the Caribbean. That's about a third of the Northern Hemisphere. We have made remarkable progress in predicting extreme weather and water events, now out to a week in advance in some instances, but as we learned from the horrific 2011 severe weather events, we also need to go beyond forecasts and warnings. We have to address the last mile to connect this information to decision makers, emergency managers, and public safety official, officials before, during, and after extreme events. From the tragic events in 2011, the concept of the Weather Ready Nation emerged and is now embraced by not only the Weather Service, but the entire weather enterprise, and especially um, as we uh, approach an impending uh, severe weather event, we all work together. We work to ensure that accurate and consistent products and services are provided to all public safety officials at all government levels. And we work together to save lives and property based on information we provide that is tied directly to their life-saving decisions. This is done through the impact basis and support services that specifically go to the public safety officials, especially the emergency management community, again, throughout the government level. Our success to build a weather ready nation is illustrated by a noted decrease in fatalities during extreme events and testimonials from our partners, which are included in my written testimony. This demonstrates how we've embraced the weather ready nation and the IDSS concepts, and that success is based on the trusted relationships with emergency managers and other public safety officials developed over the past 10 years. At the same time, you helped us make enormous structural changes to the National Weather Service budget planning and execution process. Together, we created the six portfolios aligned with ex executing the field forecast process, accelerating science and technology advances into the National Weather Service from a larger research community 
and the private sector and addressing our critical facility needs. The entire budget process is designed to support and advance our people in the field in order to meet our mission. We also worked hard to streamline the hiring process and increase our staffing levels uh, to a point now that we hadn't seen since 2015, with an increase of nearly 150 staff since 2017. We have also placed a renewed emphasis for our workforce to better, re uh, to better reflect the communities we serve. Our research and modeling has kept pace and in some cases led the rest of the world, but we got a long way to go. Um, our, our push forward uh, with a unified forecast system um, is uh, well on its way. Uh, we've created the Earth Prediction Innovation Center, EPIC, to, um, to accelerate uh, that 2 0 process, that research to operation process. And in, we've also been improving our dissemination system and developing a national blend of models as a first step in the forecast process uh, that will help, help the uh, forecasters uh, get the gridded products out faster and unlock time uh, for uh, directed towards the IDSS. Uh, so on the eve of my retirement, I can say that I'm leaving the Weather Service in a better place than I found it. I have briefed you on many issues over the years, and I've watched as your confidence in us has, re has uh, returned and deepened. Your support of the National Weather Service is invaluable, and we will need that support even more now as we move into the future marked by more extreme events fueled by the changing warmer climate, such as the record recent rainfalls, flooding, extended and flash droughts, the wildfires, extreme heat, extreme cold, and of course the uh, destructive hurricanes making landfall along the Gulf and Atlantic coast and the severe weather outbreaks that have devastated rural and sur suburban communities. All of which points to the increasing importance of the impact-based decision support services, which we have now just recently added to the National Weather Service mission statement. Serving our nation and leading the federal government's finest, most dedicated workforce has been my privilege and profound honor. I will be watching the National Weather Service with respect, pride, and gratitude for everything the most dedicated employees in the federal government bring to their job every day, and with a big thank you for what you do to empower them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Johnson. All right. Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the committee, good morning. And thank you for the opportunity to discuss our work on the National Weather Service's reform efforts and staffing challenges. While the National Weather Service has substantially followed many leading practices for effective reform, these efforts could benefit from additional actions and continued attention. My statement today discusses opportunities for the agency to enhance leadership focus and attention and to better involve employees and key stakeholders in reform efforts. I will also discuss longstanding human capital challenges that may hinder the agency's uh, reform efforts. So the first opportunity for improvement is enhancing leadership focus and attention. The National Weather Service stood up a program management office to oversee the implementation of agency reforms. However, the agency's approach to staffing the office has not provided it with the capacity to, uh, to effectively implement the reforms. Key leadership and staff positions are rotational or part-time. In five years, seven officials rotated through the director role. Also, some staff found it difficult to balance workloads from competing priorities. This rotational and part-time staffing model resulted in rework, disruption to projects, and increased risk of reforms failing. According to one senior official, these reforms are one of the most important things the National Brother Service is doing, but no one is assigned to do it. So we recommended the agency revise its approach to staffing the program management office to improve leadership and staff continuity and capacity for its reform efforts. The second opportunity to improve reform implementation is better involving employees and stakeholders in the process. 
the concern here is that um, some staff did not feel uh, that the agency was being transparent about the reforms. And there are also concerns that the agency has not sufficiently communicated with staff in the field about the reform efforts. And there are concerns that these reforms could lead to office closures and job losses. Our previous work found that failure to adequately address issues related to people and culture can lead to reforms being unsuccessful. Therefore, we're recommending that the National Weather Service develop a two-way communication strategy that outlines how the agency will listen and respond to employees' concerns about the reform efforts. In addition to implementing these opportunities for improvement, the National Weather Service will need to address its human capital challenges. Vacancies and hiring are longstanding issues that could affect the agency's capacity to, to implement these reforms. Uh, in 2017, we found that vacancies and a lengthy hiring process led managers and staff to take on additional responsibilities, uh, work additional forecasting shifts, adjust or cancel leave plans. And as a result of this, officials indicated that managers and staff experienced stress and reduced, and reduced morale, all of which may impact successful reform. So in conclusion, we do recognize that the National Weather Service has taken steps to reform its operations and workforce, further addressing leadership and staff continuity, capacity, and broader staffing challenges, as well as effectively engaging employees and key stakeholders, which strengthened the agency's reform efforts. And by doing so, moving the agency closer to achieving its vision of creating that weather-ready nation that is responsive and resilient to extreme weather events. Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the committee, this concludes my oral statement, and I'm happy to respond to questions. Thank you. You're still muted, Ms. Johnson. So sorry, I was wondering why I got no response. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. We'll go now to Mr. Werner. Good morning, and thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and committee members. As you know, the National Weather Service Employees Organization represents 3,300 employees at over 160 National Weather Service offices nationwide. These are the folks responsible for the preparation and delivery of the nation's forecasts, warnings, and impact-based decision support services that save lives, protect property, and enhance the national economy 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all year long. Now, despite an ever-expanding mission, the National Weather Service has close to 500 fewer employees than it did 10 years ago. Most of our vacant employees are operational and classified as emergency essential. These empty seats lead to serious consequences. Service assessments conducted by the Weather Service following 13 major storms that occurred between 2008 and 2018 found that the ability of the National Weather Service to protect lives during these events was compromised due to already inadequate staffing at weather forecast offices or river forecast centers. Now, according to a 2015 study conducted by McKinsey and Company, the workload at most forecast offices exceeds the available meteorologist workforce. And in May of 2019, which, or in May of 2017, that was pointed out, the GAO released a study requested by members of this committee, which revealed that the vacancy rate in National Weather Service operational units has reached a point where employees are unable at times to perform key tasks. They further found that staff experienced stress fatigue and reduced morale resulting from their efforts to cover for vacancies due to lack of time off and loss of training. According to the GAO, the National Weather Service managers admit that employees are demoralized because they had to cover the workload for multiple vacancies. Now, since the GAO and McKenzie studies were conducted, understaffing at National Weather Service has not improved. The chart that will be displayed shows that the number of non-managerial, non-supervisory employees on board over the past 10 years, according to the data that National Weather Service routinely provides to us, 
Um, the latest data depicted here is from July of this year. We did receive updated numbers yesterday after we had submitted this graphic. So as of September 25th, there has been a slight increase to 3,400 from the numbers that we've been provided. Now, the National Weather Service Employees Organization has from the outset pushed for and supported the concept of impact-based decision support services. Going forward, we just need to appropriately resource it to sustain it. Adequate staffing is critical to meeting the current and growing demands for our decision support service to key partners in the emergency managing, management community at all levels of government. One initiative purported by management to free up more forecaster time is the use of the national blend of models. MBM as a starting point for our gridded forecast database. We are unsure at this time how much processing time this may save, if any. We believe the challenge with using the MBM as a starting point is to ensure the forecast is not degraded by the loss of local weather expertise that our experienced forecasters add to the process. As widely reported in the media, National Weather Service's current dissemination and information infrastructure has proven to be unreliable. We are though encouraged to see that the House Appropriations Committee recommended a funding increase of close to $37 million in the FY22 budget to improve dissemination. A robust and stable infrastructure is a must. Another factor which may hinder the building of a weather-ready nation is the unequal distribution of experienced forecasters and employees. Um, and employees departing from the National Weather Service due to the lack of mobility. Both of these are a result of the implementation of the 2019 GS5 through 12 meteorologist career ladder progression. The focus has been placed on just filling vacancies with new hires and not enough on maintaining a healthy experience balance among the meteorologist staff at offices who have had a large turnover during the past couple of years. And we need to strive to retain current employees, many of whom are frustrated due to the lack of opportunity to move to a more desirable location. And many are now considering careers outside of the National Weather Service. But in closing, I would like to thank this committee for its support of the employees that the National Weather Service Employees Organization represents. Aside from our significant resource and process challenges, I truly believe that the National Weather Service, along with the rest of NOAA, is a fantastic organization with an unparalleled mission, supported by employees who ded whose dedication and passion are second to none. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our final witness is Mr. Selma. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Ranking Member, and Congressman Jimenez, and members of the committee. It is an honor to be with you today representing Florida International University, Miami's public research university. We are excited to share our insights as a Weather Ready Nation ambassador. Investments from the state of Florida and federal partners, including NOAA and the National Science Foundation, have advanced our research at FIU. NSF has designated the Wall of Wind, which replicates a Category 5 hurricane, is one of the nation's eight major experimental facilities under the Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructure Program. And we are privileged to have the National Hurricane Center and the National Weather Service Miami office on our main campus here in Miami. Our International Hurricane Research Center, or IHRC, was designated the very first Weather Ready Nation ambassador in South Florida in 2014. And here is a brief snapshot of how Weather Ready Nation has made an impact in South Florida. To begin with, Weather Ready Nations are NOAA's boots on the ground. IHRC education and outreach takes hurricane mitigation and preparedness into the community through national NOAA Weather Service partnerships. This includes high visibility public education events like the Eye of the Storm and successful hurricane exhibits at the Museum of Discovery and Science in Fort Lauderdale. And our Spanish language hurricane website, huracanes.fiu.edu, which speaks to the country's changing demographics and partnering with the National Hurricane Center on the Hurricane Awareness Tour. And our K through 12 programs prepare our youngest and next generation of Weather Ready Nation ambassadors. This includes teacher workshops in the Wall of Wind Challenge, which inspires students uh, to pursue STEM degrees by challenging teams to develop innovative and mitigation concepts, which are then tested at the wall of wind. Now, many top research universities like FIU are Weather Ready Nation ambassadors, and we literally take 
our science to the people. At FIU, our research has a purpose. Either we reduce risk or risk will reduce us. Through NHC's joint hurricane testbed, FIU's CES storm surge model is helping the center storm surge forecasting. And we are collaborating to develop a coastal forecast system in the Caribbean region. We work with NOAA's Hurricane Research Division and the Environmental Modeling Center are improving hurricane forecast models, specifically rapid intensification. And alongside USAID, we are also focused on disaster risk reduction in Latin America and the Caribbean. So building a weather-ready nation is a team effort. FIU's success as a weather-ready nation ambassador comes from a multi-partner approach working together with NOAA and the National Weather Service. And as we move forward, here are some thoughts on how we can work with Congress and NOAA to strengthen the future Weather Ready Nation. Continued collaboration investments can enhance weather forecasting research, including hurricane track and intensity to improve warnings, storm surge modeling research to improve public evacuations, and social science research to improve the linkage between National Weather Service products and public understanding. The best forecast in the world is useless if the public doesn't respond or hasn't taken the needed actions to protect itself. Also, future workforce. At FIU, we believe that our demography is our destiny and that of the country. NOAA has a great opportunity to collaborate with existing research university partners in particular, urban, public, minority-serving institutions like FIU to recruit a highly skilled and diverse workforce. Communicating weather readiness to diverse and more digital audiences. NOAA and its ambassadors must reach broader, more diverse audiences. The FIU Spanish language website is just one example. And vulnerable populations. Embrace building a weather-ready weather nation for all by addressing vulnerable populations' needs and resource inequities. And at the end of the day, it's all about people, families, and livelihoods. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you so very much. At this time, I would like to ask the unanimous consent to submit a letter for the record from the president of the International Association of Emergency Managers, in the support of the National Weather Service and of Dr. Ussolini, tenure of the Weather Service without objection, so ordered. First questions will begin and I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Dr. Ussolini, what concrete steps with the National Weather Service uh, is taken to address gender and racial diversity gaps in the workforce? Well, we've um, certainly uh, have uh, renewed our focus on, uh, on the issues, um, not only from a weather service perspective, but from a NOAA perspective. And um, we're actually showing success in that regard in the number of women and minorities that we're bringing into uh, the National Weather Service. Um, and, um, you know, we're actually um, not happy in the sense that um, the, um, we always strive to do better in these areas. So I think it's um, important to focus on what we're doing now to uh, improve um, and, um, and to retain. Now, this, is, this is also another important issue uh, for both uh, women on uh, in the National Weather Service and, and minorities, uh, we're seeing retention rates that are, are quite frankly uh, in a minority area that are not acceptable. So uh, we're working those issues as well. Well, thank you. Why is having a robust, uh, dynamic, and diverse workforce critical uh, for advancing weather forecasting? Well, we certainly uh, embrace the notion that we need to uh, look um, like the uh, communities we serve. And the nation itself is becoming more diverse. I think everybody recognizes that. Uh, important to us, we have large segments of the United States in which uh, Spanish might be a primary language. So we have to deal with those issues. 
Um, we have uh, urban environments that are particularly vulnerable uh, to uh, heat, as an example, and, and pollution. Uh, we need to better focus on that and, and, and work with the communities uh, that, that suffer from that. Now, having stated that, uh, we've uh, shown a lot of success in areas over the, over the past 20, 25 years in working with uh, indigenous uh, people, uh, the native Alaskan communities, the uh, tribal nations, the Southwest Pacific Island states. Uh, so we, we, have, we believe we have a foundation to work from uh, to address the, um, the issues as uh, they am, are emerging today. Well, thank you. Any witness would like to comment? Okay. The National Weather Service uh, initiated a series of reforms in 2017 to help it achieve strategic vision of building a weather service nation. Two of the main goals are to free up staff time and improve service to partners. Uh, these initiatives are are in various stages of completion. The 2021 GAO report makes recommendations to the National Weather Service on its reform activities, the EVAL program and the national blend models. Uh, Mr. Johnson, do you think that is the most important step the Weather Service needs to take to implement um, these uh, reforms? Well, thank you for that question. So, uh, we would say that successful reform is rooted in having uh, leadership and staff continuity and capacity, as well as effective communication. So the most important uh, step that the, the National Weather Service can take is to provide that uh, leadership and staff continuity and capacity uh, to the pro uh, program management office that oversees the implementation of these reforms. That um, continuity and capacity is going to ensure that the organization has uh, the tools, skills, and resources to see these reforms through. And at the, the, the same time, um, the National Weather Service would need to effectively engage uh, its employees and key stakeholders. Uh, that will help um, employees and, and stakeholders understand the nature of the changes gain their buy-in uh, and ownership of them. So yes, the important steps is having that continuity and capacity and effective uh, communications. Okay, many of the weather services staff and hiring and operation issues discussed in the GAO report are longstanding. What do you think has been hindering the weather service and making more progress? Uh, well, to be fair, uh, you know, these reforms, implementing agency reforms is pretty difficult uh, and, and hard to do. Uh, and it's, it's just going to take some time. But with that said, there are two issues, uh, staffing and transparency. Uh, with respect to staffing, in the National Weather Service has longstanding challenges with workforce capacity and continuity. Um, our work has identified uh, those increasing vacancy rates, uh, lengthy hiring process, challenges with staff balancing workload. Uh, so we'd point for the need for the Weather Service to complete a workforce uh, analysis to address those. And, and National Weather Service has actually recognized this and they uh, have this on their, their plan to do. And again, I would go back to with respect to transparency, uh, the need for that effective uh, engagement with with stakeholders. So what we've heard is that um, you know the National Weather Service has taken steps to communicate information. I do want to be fair with that. Uh, but the staff that we've talked to, uh, they said that receiving email updates or posting information to uh, the intranet page is just not really sufficient for the massive amount of change that's taking place, uh, and they're concerned about the potential impact. So we would recommend. Um, to address that, the transparency that they develop this two-way communication strategy that's going to outline how they're going to listen and respond. So those two things, the transparency and the staffing, uh, if they address those, uh, we believe that they will uh, be able to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my time has expired. I now recognize our ranking member of the committee, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Uccellini. 
it's always been a pleasure having you testify before this committee. And you and I have worked together on the best policies to improve weather forecasting for the better part of a decade. So I want to take a wide angle and kind of look backwards before looking forward. Can, and you can be as specific as you'd like. But my question is, what has the Weather Act of 2017 meant to the weather community? Um, I think the Weather Act has been the most uh, important um, legislation and indication of support from, the, from this government in my entire career, um, community, which spans 50 years. Uh, we embraced the Weather Act and um, all five uh, titles, uh, all five segments of it, uh, to um, move uh, not only the Weather Service forward, but uh, the larger enterprise forward, uh, including the other components of NOAA, the research satellite components especially. Um, it's just been an enormous um, uh, foundational um, basis for moving forward uh, since it came out um, in April of uh, 2000, I believe it was 2017. Um, it, it's, just been, it's just been tremendous. One of the examples is the recognition that our job doesn't end with the forecast and warning um, and, and authorized us to provide the uh, impact-based decision support services over all government levels. Uh, we've embraced that and to the point, and I would say that our workforce has embraced it and we've been very transparent with our workforce on this. Should note that I have visited more than 120 offices um, and other leaders within the Weather Service uh, are right up there next to those numbers as well. Engaging with the workforce for hours, both in the office and over dinner, which goes on for hours because we are trying to be transparent here. And this IDSS has been a critical um, uh, reform uh, in going beyond the forecast and warning and engaging these decision makers. And I believe uh, we need to continue on that on that track. So, and the Weather Act and research, the commercial aspects, the private sector, the tsunami aspect, uh, the seasonal, the subseasonal, um, all of the above. Um, it's it's um, it's been a tremendous boost for us moving forward. Thank you, Doctor, and I appreciate those comments because we live in a very cynical time, both uh, in Congress and the general public. But the fact is, we do good work, and this committee did good work in 2017. And I appreciate your acknowledgement. Now that said, looking from this point forward, what is your observations about what is missing from the Weather Act or what's still needed within the weather community to maximize our forecasting abilities? Look forward now. Well, the, um, we're living in a time when the, um, we, we, we can see it. We can visualize that the impacts of these systems, uh, the intensity of these uh, weather systems are increasing. We're seeing it in the fire um, uh, aspect. Uh, we, we don't have fire seasons anymore, we have fire years. They burn hotter and they move faster. Uh, the extreme heat, extreme cold, um, the, uh, the flooding, um, the, the rainfall rates. I mean, we're seeing rainfall rates in what we call extra tropical latitudes where the United States sits itself we're seeing rainfall rates that haven't been observed before, hourly rainfall rates. That last flood in New York City that flooded subways, it's the first time that I, I've been able to find that subways have been flooded from rainfall. They've been flooded from uh, surges off of the ocean. So we are living in times where the demand for what we do is going to grow and it's going to be essential for people to respond to these types of events. This is a research issue. The research community has to be involved. It, it's it's a, an operational issue uh, with respect to the technology and science we have to bring into our operations to address these types of systems that have not been observed before. And, and then we have the social science issue um, that connects our forecast and warnings to decision-making and accounts for the risk factors. I mean, we're confronted with how do you communicate these impacts on something that people haven't observed before. Okay, that's that's a big task to get people to respond. 
And that's not only on us, it's on the public safety officials at every government level that have to work these issues. Well, Doctor, I'll simply conclude by saying thank you for your decades and decades of public service. Uh, there are good people in all branches of the federal government and your classic example. With that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move to the staff to recognize members in proper order. Ms. Bonamici is recognized. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Chair Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas. And thank you to our witnesses. And uh, as someone who spent a lot of time working on the Weather Research and Forecasting Innovation Act of 2017 with Mr. Lucas and others, I appreciate your question, Mr. Lucas. And I also appreciate your response, uh, Dr. Uccellini. Uh, that being said, in 2018, I did join my committee colleagues in requesting a study from the GAO regarding the National Weather Service's efforts to reform and modernize under the Evolve program. In its most recent study uh, published in response to our request, uh, the GAO found that the National Weather Service had adhered to practices for effective reform, but has not adequately implemented several recommendations, in including a communication strategy that listens and responds to employee concerns about the Evolve program. So according to the study, NWS officials planned on finalizing a communication strategy by the end of fiscal year 2021, which ended a few weeks ago. So, so Mr. Werner, will you please explain in further detail how the lack of a clear two-way communication strategy has affected members of the National Weather Service Employees Organization? What improvements you would like to see and the benefits of a more effective two-way communication strategy? Thank you, Congresswoman Bonanici. Um, that's a, uh, there's a lot, a lot to unpack into that. I think we have started communicating some over the past year, uh, but there has been a distinct lack of transparency. And you understand if you go ahead and do something in a vacuum at the top levels, a mile high, and then you come down with what's a great idea, maybe it doesn't translate well into the field. Uh, I think it's a benefit to get the synergy you know, come up with visions, come up with ideas, but let's integrate the whole process from the field offices to the regional level to the national level. So everybody's kind of on the same page. Where do we want to go? But what's the best way to implement this so it'll actually work? Uh, we talk about the NBM and National Blended Models as being a time saver. Well, we have a region out there who's been using a blended model for 10 years in the extended forecast. Another region has been using it for five years. So these are not things that haven't been tried at the grassroots level to try to go ahead and prove the forecast and to improve time. So communication transparency is absolutely important. And I think everyone knows if, 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 you do, if the information is not flowing, then the rumors start and the conspiracy start. We need to go ahead and have that open dialogue and be transparent. What do we want to do? And then let the employees decide, how are we going to do that? Let them be involved. Thank you Hopefully so much. that answered your question. Okay. Yes, it did. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And look forward to uh, further information about how changes will be implemented. And so I have another question. In the past three decades, we know the United States has sustained more than 300 weather disasters costing the nation more than $2 trillion. And climate change has increased the severity and frequency of these extreme weather events. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, my home in Oregon, we experienced record-breaking heat waves that killed hundreds of people, including here in my home state. Clearly, accurate and accessible forecasts are more important than ever. And though technological improvements have increased the accuracy of forecasts and warning, there are still reliability issues. So in March of this year, the NWS's network crashed and impeded public access to its life-saving services, as well as the NWS chat function that's used by thousands to discuss hazardous events in real time. So Dr. Uccellini, last year, uh, NOAA released its cloud strategy, which outlines the administration's goal for accelerating cloud-based service integration. So will you please explain the progress and the timeline for integration of the National Weather Service data into a commercial cloud platform and elaborate on the extent to which these information system upgrades will prevent future outages and failures? Okay, so, um, so first of all, I want to thank um, um, the, the Hill uh, for providing uh, extra resources uh, in the fiscal year 21 budget, $1.5 million increase in our dissemination effort. Uh, we were finally able to get the plan through the system and up to the Hill that uh, we've uh, been developing over the last several years. And that does include a cloud smart 
um, approach uh, to um, how we um, um, are advancing uh, capabilities. Uh, with respect to, I think uh, you perhaps are referring to the, um, the part of the, our dissemination program, which involves um, the chat, the ability to chat, uh, not only within the weather service, but with our partners outside a very critical function. And uh, with the resources, we've, um, we're not only dealing with the transition of what has been the legacy system developed uh, many years ago, which was not uh, transportable into the new technology. So we used uh, and the resources to transition that. Um, and we're about a month away uh, from the uh, first uh, um, abilities to uh, run the chat on the new system. But we're also in parallel, and, and this gets you to the cloud, we're uh, working with the, um, uh, uh, to a, com a competitive process, the Slack, um, uh, demo now is uh, ongoing, uh, which is cloud-based, um, and we, um, you know, we have about another, we just started in October with the demo, uh, we'll go another um, uh, several weeks, and then assess, um, and then make decisions from that assessment. We take a very, um, as I think uh, Cardell Johnson was pointing to, we take a very systematic approach to any changes in our operational systems with with our users fully engaged uh, as we're doing with this demo, uh, including the emergency management community and especially the emergency management community, but others also in the community. So that's, that's an example. We're also transitioning um, um, functions that have been on a dissemination platform that perhaps uh, can be moved uh, on to other platforms. And our first uh, effort in that uh, involves the um, the uh, multi-radar, multi-spectrum um, uh, development uh, efforts, and and we showed success in that, and we're all we're now considering uh, other um, functions as well as the resources are made available. These transition of operational systems uh, does take resources, and we take a very um, careful approach uh, with this. So those Thank are you, examples. Lady, my, we've my certainly. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Dr. Uccellini, my, my time has expired, but as I yield back, I want to thank you so much for your uh, years of service. You've had an illustrious career, and we uh, all appreciate your work and wish you the very best. I, and I yield thank back. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Thank you Posey, Mr. Posey is recognized. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, for holding this meeting. And uh, uh, Dr. Ocellini, thank you so much for your years of dedicated service. Um, wonderful, wonderful service. Uh, as it stands now, NOAA's Ocean Service and the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science are the de facto leaders for harmful algal blooms forecasting. Uh, they've developed the algal bloom monitoring system for locating, monitoring, and quantifying algal blooms in coastal and lake regions across the country. Our uh, question is, what role does the National Weather Service play in harmful algae blooms forecasting, especially when it comes to the effect that severe storms like hurricanes have on algae blooms conditions and movement? So one of the things we do is um, we partner with the National Ocean Service that actually runs the forecast models for the bays, the coastal areas, and the harmful algae bloom. Uh, we work uh, with them in terms of uh, uh, providing the computing capacity, for example. Uh, they run those models uh, on what is our, uh, been looked at as the weather uh, operational models. And the reason is, is that they need weather parameters from our own models uh, to actually drive components of their prediction system. Uh, after the forecasts are made, um, we um, have positioned uh, the relevant forecast offices, and this has been, um, you know, uh, embraced by the the especially in the local offices, embraced by the workforce uh, in those offices, uh, to serve as um, a service outlets uh, in a sense, and work very, um, uh, very uh, diligently with the, the partners in NOS um, and with the um, uh, the people receiving uh, the information that make decisions like along the Gulf Coast um, in Florida and also in Lake Erie. So we, there are quote unquote operational systems that uh, we work uh, with our partners in NOS and deliver those forecasts and work with the decision makers accordingly. Well, thank you. Uh, can you think of uh, the National Weather Service ability to do um, 
more for home algal blooms forecasting? Can you think of what else we might be able to do? Well, the, the science and, and, the, um, and the abilities actually lie in the National Ocean Service and in um, the Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Research Group, OAR, the, uh, for example, the uh, Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab. We work with them as they're developing these new advances. Um, and I could say that we learned from them. It's really been one of the learning experiences as uh, um, for me um, and recognizing that the harmful algae bloom in, uh, in uh, fresh water lakes, for example, like Lake Erie can actually be more toxic than what happens along the coast. And I know in Florida, you have that, that combination of Lake o Okeechobee water and, and the Gulf water coming together and, and providing these blooms over a two, three month period. So, um, but we, from a science perspective, we rely on those other components. From a service perspective, we are working with them to, um, to make sure that we can get the connectivity with the local decision makers uh, that, that need this information, whether it's the water, whether it's the uh, fish, the shellfish uh, folks, whatever. So it's, a, it's really a true partnership within NOAA that's bringing this um, expertise and this ability uh, through the service pipelines into the communities. How important is it uh, to understand coupled ocean atmosphere interactions for weather forecasting? Oh, it's very, it's one of the main, main um, uh, factors we have to work towards uh, to improve ourselves in the future. It's not just the atmosphere for us, it's the entire Earth system. It's Earth system science and the ocean atmospheric coupling is an incredible a component of that. My colleague, my leader in OAR, Craig McLean, handed me a bumper sticker that says, if you like your seven day weather forecast, thank an oceanographer. I have that in my office um, that I've not been in for about, uh, uh, I would say now 80, 82 weeks. So, um, but it is true. And I've been the co-chair in the World Meteorological Organization uh, for the effort to bring the ocean and atmospheric communities together uh, as organizations uh, to address these issues into the future. So it's not just in the United States, it really is a truly a global uh, issue. We've got to bring a coupled approach uh, in, in the entire Earth system forward to advance our forecast capabilities. Uh, thank you very much. I see my time has expired and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Bear is recognized. Thank you, and I want to thank the chairwoman and the ranking member for, for having this hearing. Obviously, in my home state of California and my home district and in Northern California and the Sacramento region, we've been dealing with um, devastating wildfires uh, as the, the whole West Coast and Western United States has. And, and unfortunately, it's becoming the, the norm. Maybe um, this is a question for Dr. Um, Cuccellini. You know, one of the um, causes of these wildfires are the high winds that are coming through um, Northern California, which is leading to um, electricity shutoff decisions, et cetera. Um, could you talk a little bit about how NOAA and the National Weather Service, um, the role that they play in providing some of that information for these shutoff decisions, which really do affect large swaths of Northern California and what additional research um, we might be able to support to, to um, provide better decision making on these shutoff decisions. Okay. Well, we um, we do provide our forecast. Uh, we make it available to all um, uh, all components of the um, uh, the commercial sector and and um, and uh, of course uh, the public safety officials, government officials that have to make tough decisions. Um, and uh, you know that's our forecast information directly from the models, our forecast information directly from the national blend of models, um, and the uh, forecasts that come from the local offices, which are all consistent, and they all get more of a tailored approach to the community. However, many of the, um, uh, if not all, of the utility companies now either have their internal meteorological um, groups, or they have private sector firms that provide information um, and those private sector firms, we work in partnership also to ensure consistency in, in uh, what we're uh, putting forward. So with respect to the decision process that the utilities make, they, they have 
um, the information stream to them. And 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 one of the things that I could say as a, as a as an enterprise, as a as a community, we're able to make these forecasts for extreme events and extreme wind events um, out you know, with a, a greater level of accuracy and certainty out to a week in advance. So I can imagine that there's a tremendous lead time and, a, and, and risk assessment that's going on inside uh, those utility companies uh, to make those decisions. But we're not part of that decision process. We're providing the information into it and uh, they uh, tailor it and, and make those decisions. But I would say that um, as an entity, uh, the lead time and accuracy for these forecasts have been actually pretty remarkable. Great, and you know, maybe for any of the witnesses, um, also in my home district, obviously um, Sacramento historically has been a very flood prone region. And um, you, know, you wouldn't know, know it today if you went to Folsom Lake, which you know, is a big reservoir. Um, we're living through you know, probably one of the worst droughts, certainly in, in the 30 years that, that I've lived out here. Um, from a predictive model, how, do, how far in advance can we, and again, maybe this again is for Dr. Uccellini, um, how far in advance can we predict what the, the weather season you know, coming up is gonna, gonna be like? And how do we integrate that with you know, global data as well in other countries? Well, uh, what we are seeing um, uh, in our discussions with the National Academy of Sciences, for example, from June, 2020, um, and other engagements with the scientific community, we not only have an operational prediction challenge when you're getting into these uh, extended time periods, we have what we call a predictability challenge, and that there are, um, you know, there's a there's a level of predictability that rapidly declines um, even as you get into two weeks and beyond. Um, so with precipitation, it's particularly uh, that's that's a, a process, that's a a factor uh, of of um, of the atmosphere that really loses predictability uh, fairly quickly. And it, one of the big challenges that we all face, whether you know, speaking from the research community or the operational community, is how uh, to um, uh, engage whatever predictability there is uh, in, in the signals that we have, whether it's directly from the numerical models or from tracking these large scale patterns like the Ma Maddie and Julian oscillation or up the Enzo pattern in the Pacific, the El Nino, La Nina patterns. Um, we can use those and we can bring past experiences to those, but from a, a hard core, core a predictive approach, uh, we realize that there's a lot of uncertainty uh, involved in using that information. Um, so, uh, but the users demand it. I mean, you know, the society is trying to make decisions based exactly on what's happening in your state and, and your water supply. So uh, we're bringing the information as best we can with the level of uncertainty involved, uh, clearly stated uh, to those users to make the difficult decision. I, I, I see my time has expired, so um, I'll yield back. Thank you again for your service, Dr. Uccellini. Okay. Mr. Weber is recognized. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Uccellini, this is for Dr. you, Dr. Uccellini. <clears throat> you heard it already said, it's a tribute basically to you and your leadership that many, many companies and organizations have signed up to serve as ambassadors in support of having a weather ready nation. So suffice it to say, I guess your expertise and leadership created help, created and helped coin the term, quote, weather ready nation, end quote. Of course, we're in Texas where we have just about every weather phenomenon there is. I don't know that we're, but we ever, get all that ready sometimes we get fooled but you understood that nonetheless you understood this was an opportunity program for increased engagement uh, and partnerships with the private sector uh, weather forecast companies with members of america's weather and climate industry and they wholeheartedly supported the weather ready nation program dr Uselini, if you could take this time to speak to the partnership between nws and the private sector weather forecasters and how they work closely with the National Weather Service towards building that weather ready nation. Could you speak to that, please, sir? Yes, I, I'd, I'd be glad to. Um, we recognize that addressing the public safety 
for the Weather Service to address the public safety uh, mission. Um, and you've heard you've heard comments uh, now from the GAO and from uh, from Nuisio. Um, it'd be you know we don't have the resources uh, to um, even even um, optimally uh, deal with all the issues there. So you'll see private sector firms that even work are now working with us like through the chat uh, uh, function, uh, uh, collaborate actually or pass through our warnings at times uh, now that they didn't even five years ago because we all are recognizing the need to work together for consistent messaging um, and, and the private sector then will take that and tailor it to specific customers uh, across the wide uh, berth of, of activities, agriculture, energy, uh, you know, water supply, et cetera. So I, I just think, or transportation, I just think that um, that partnership is essential. We, can't, we cannot do this alone. When we uh, designed the Weather Ready Nation as a strategic goal um, and, and brought you know, a, a vision on how to get to that goal, the first thing we heard back from the National Academy of Public Administration when they reviewed it based on a congressional, um, uh, congressional language, uh, they said, hey, this is a great strategic outcome. You can't do it alone, right? You, you're gonna need other agencies. You're gonna need the private sector. We need the academic community. We're getting into social science to be able to communicate risk, all of the above. So this is the success of this program will depend on our partnerships. And if I might add, I can tell you from the, a global perspective, the private public partnership in the United States is looked on as the gold standard of the world. Other parts of the world are wondering how we do it, quite frankly. So um, I'll just say that uh, one of the other reasons I embrace it, not because we can't do it, we can't do it all. One of the other reasons I embrace it is that it's a job creator. I watch the students come out and get jobs, and uh, it's really, uh, it's really delightful to uh, see that. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank thank you for that. You're to be commended for your service. And I will say that uh, we are taking applications for retirees here in Texas. I'll, I'll think about that. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, and I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Stevens is recognized. Great. Um, thank you so much um, for this very important hearing, and it really touches to the core of something that we have experienced and dealt with here in Michigan in a very visceral way, which is in Metro Detroit, uh, we have been hit with storm after storm after storm for the balance of months, um, oftentimes without any ability to have warning. Um, thunderstorms that turn into tornadoes, thunderstorms that turn into supercells, basements that have been flooded, disaster declarations, small businesses that were just beginning to reopen and had to close again. Uh, unbelievable power outages uh, and, and certainly very pertinent as we're on the, the heels of uh, or just getting ready to pass some incredible um, infrastructure and sustainability legislation. But relevant to, to today's hearing um, is this ability to predict. And, 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 and certainly I, I, I want to put the, the onus on all of you, right? It's how can we better predict the, the supercell storm, rapid high winds that just knocked over our big, big, beautiful trees in the city of Farmington and Farmington Hills. Uh, neighbors telling me we didn't even get a warning, um, but but more so, I I want to ask, and and maybe this is um, a, a question um, for Mr. Salna as well as Mr. Uh, Cardell Johnson. Um, just given that you you are digging at this, um, are there tools and technologies uh, that will enable us 
to, to, to better predict? Is there training we should be putting in place at the county or at the local level in particular when I, certainly I've been hearing um, uh, uh, Dr. Uccelli talk about uh, some of these challenges with the National Weather Service. But I, I just want to take this a step further and hear from you at the at the university level, and certainly, um, Mr. Carnell, from your uh, Mr. Johnson, from your uh, GAO study. Is there the opportunity to better predict? And Mr. Selma, if you would like to start, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, there's a couple of ways uh, we could we could look at that. Um, one thing that is used uh, within the research community um, with uh, NOAA and the universities are what's called uh, federal labs and test banks. And it's a great collaboration that we've had here at FIU, where we've collaborated with NOAA and the National Hurricane Center through test beds uh, and other grant programs to overcome you know, certain restrictions, but that collaboration of the academic with, um, you know, the government agency, uh, it's been uh, very successful. And it also, our connection with the National Science Foundation and the Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructure Program uh, with our wall of wind. As we like to say, we don't want silos. We want collaboration and bring people together. So when you have an open forum for research and testing proposals from all across the country, for example, coming to the Wall of Wind, where we can test not only for hurricane force winds, but we can test for uh, lower uh, speed wind events like derechos and, and things that make the derechos. Correct. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that's one way to look at it is, is now, because that all leads to improvement in the models when we talk about the weather forecasting models. So these test beds, so continue our efforts and support in, in those kinds of environments to make advances in the models. Mr. Johnson. All right, um, thank you for that question. So uh, our work that we've done uh, since 2017 till now on this, uh, really haven't focused on uh, looking at the different technologies for, for prediction, but more of um, the how do we um, manage how the National Weather Service is managing the reform efforts. But one thing that I can say from the work that we've done, I think this is where the, the Weather Service is focused on uh, the national blend of models. Uh, and you know, having a good common point for developing forecasts so that they can be able to uh, predict information and get that out through its uh, impact-based decision support services to community to have that, that lead time. Uh, so we know that um, they're doing work to refine that model. There have been uh, some concerns uh, uh, about the, the accuracy of it in terms of uh, working with certain terrain or weather conditions. Uh, but the, the Weather Service is aware of those. They're engaging their employees uh, on the technical aspects and, and making those refinements. And hopefully that through IDSS uh, may help with the predictions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And I yield back. Mr. Babin is recognized. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Ranking Member. And also want to thank the witnesses today. It's very, very interesting. Uh, I have the honor of representing Southeast Texas uh, from Houston over basically to Louisiana, uh, which unfortunately has been the center of devastating 500 year floods that seem to come almost yearly now. Uh, and four years ago, Hurricane Harvey dumped the single largest amount of rainfall in recorded history uh, in our country, and in fact, North America. Uh, in mine and also in uh, uh, Randy Weber's district, which is right next door. And since then, we've had several hurricanes, tropical storms leave much of Southeast Texas underwater, et cetera. And this sort of reoccurring devastation uh, not only upends the lives of thousands of people, but has enormous implications on our federal budget. Uh, these disasters every year leave the taxpayers responsible for colossal bills that are needed for recovery, investing in money, uh, excuse me, investing money in mitigation efforts seems to be an incredibly wise investment that could and will save billions of dollars every year in damage. 
So, Mr. Salna, uh, I would ask you, since Hurricane Harvey, there has been a great effort to promote resilience in order to help communities be better prepared for future extreme weather events. FIU's uh, Extreme Events Institute is at the forefront of reducing the impact of natural hazards uh, through research and the advancement of technology that strengthens response, improves recovery, and mitigates exposure to risk. Can you please expound, short, uh, just a short answer if you don't mind, uh, upon the importance of mitigation efforts and how the model that you're working on in Florida could be translated to different areas such as East Texas, Southeast Texas? Sure, thank you. Um, yes, sir. So resilience, that's, that's the key word, right? And how can we all be more resilient? And another one of the words is, is mitigation. And as we know, we've heard of that formula for every $1 spent on mitigation saves at least $6 in damage and cleanup. So it makes fiscal sense to do what we can on the front end, right? To build stronger, build better. So um, <coughs> test uh, does that with testing infrastructure. That's related to building codes where there's certainly room for improvement on building codes across the country. Florida is the leader, has the strongest building codes, and they can be uh, uh, replicated in other regions of the country, especially hurricane prone uh, states. And we have this model, the Florida Public Hurricane Loss Model, uh, with the state of Florida and the Office of Insurance Regulation. And that's a model. Now you can uh, predict what the damage cost would be to a land falling a storm. So that's a tool that will then verify and then show you that if you do this kind of mitigation, you look at the savings you're going to make. So this is how we have to think. We can't uh, do things like we've done in the past when it comes to where we build and how we build. And because our exposure has increased across the coastlines and in Southeast Texas, you know, that exposure is there, buildings and people in harm's way. So we need to get them protected. We need to get them uh, prepared. And so vulnerabilities, that's what we need to look at. How is the infrastructure strengthened with building codes, preparedness and safety, and getting together with emergency management as one of those team members and all of that. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Salma. Uh, secondly, uh, serving as the ranking member of the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee, I'm interested in the collaboration effort between NASA and NOAA. Uh, particularly the long-standing issue of research to operations. And so Dr. Uccellini, as the director of the National Weather Service, uh, you are well aware uh, uh, that the NWS is the very tip of the spear for operational weather forecasting. And you recently announced, uh, you recently announced your uh, retirement after decades of service. And I wanna thank you for that. You've done an excellent job and made this country, I think a lot more secure and confident uh, at the approaching storms that we, we have. Uh, but you recently, after your, your announcement, is there anything that you think should have, that you could have done better to enable that research to operations transition, but were unable to do for one reason or another, just out of curiosity, if you would like to uh, uh, elaborate on that, I would appreciate it. Well, yeah, actually you're looking at someone who lived the uh, research to operation. I worked at NASA for 11 years, um, established a research career, and then came over to the operational world uh, to learn what the other half of the equation was. And one of the things that um, I did uh, with um, um, uh, my leaders that I left at, at NASA Goddard at Space Flight Center was we established a joint center for satellite data assimilation. And that's been very successful in bringing uh, research satellite data to us, but also preparing us for the future operational data that we now implement in the uh, models. And that includes not only the National Weather Service, but NESDIS, the, the satellite service component of, um, of uh, NOAA uh, and other researchers throughout the community. And it's really been a tremendous success. Um, but there are other things that we can do. Uh, NASA has established a, a, an organization they call SPORT, don't ask me to define the acronym, but what they've done is they've done research on our operational AWIP system that's in every local uh, forecast office. They've brought uh, advancements onto that system. What does that do? 
That allows us to get those advancements into the local forecast offices, into the national centers faster. And we've been doing that. In fact, we've been doing that for fires, we've been doing that for floods, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we have a very strong relationship with NASA and um, I hope that we uh, that NOAA and NASA continue that kind of linkage as, uh, as they move forward. Excellent, thank you very much. And uh, with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Mr. McNerney is recognized. Well, I, I thank the uh, witnesses for uh, your testimony this morning. It's, uh, it's really interesting uh, to hear uh, the evolution of the, uh, in, uh, the weather service uh, and uh, uh, what, what you've been able to accomplish over the years. Um, so my first question uh, will be um, to uh, Dr. Ussolini. Over the past few years, California has been devastated by historic wildfire seasons. The Weather Service Incident Meteorologist or the IMETs are critical uh, to helping our fire managers and incident uh, commanders. Um, you mentioned in your testimony, the IMETs are being stretched too thin with only uh, 89 trained IMET forecasters and 18 in training. What's the actual need uh, for IMETs? Well, the, uh, we've, we've actually been increasing the IMET um, uh, numbers uh, and making them uh, more available uh, uh, to um, uh, to these um, offices that, and to these areas that need it. We coordinated, of course, through the uh, the NIFSCI, the the group um, up in um, in Idaho, and and that's how our folks get assigned uh, to the fires. The fact is, we've just set a record this year now for the number of IMET IMET deployments, but we've been increasing those numbers. And, and training. One of the stress points on this is that with the fire season growing in time, you know, I think the fire community calls it a fire year now, that actually impacts on the training. You know, there's the downtime, used to, you, we used to use the downtime for training, uh, continued training, because they have to be certified to be on the lines uh, with the firefighters. And these are really brave souls that are, are out there fighting the fires and, and, and the IMETs are actually right next to them, okay, right with them. So um, uh, we, um, uh, we have that kind of an issue, but we have worked very hard over the last two years seeing this trend line to get those numbers up. These IMETs are, are actually located in offices across the country and as they're assigned, they fly in and they, and they go into the fire um, area. Uh, we get, we're impre increasing the numbers where Dealing with the uh, the struggle on time to make sure that they're all certified through training, and um, and this year we we've, we've met the record of uh, basically we've broken the record numbers, and um, um, yeah it, it's a stress point, but it's um, it's uh, it's a stress that we're uh, addressing I believe. Very good. Um, well, we expect the the need for IMS to be growing over the uh, the next few years. Um, especially with fire season coming around uh, and, and or fire year, as you put it, coming around. Um, are we specifically addressing that need? Are you specifically addressing or yes. plan to address that need? Yes, and we're working uh, uh, through uh, the administration has um, uh, cited this as a priority. We're working through the interagency approaches uh, to this and, um, and responding to the needs accordingly. But we are internally addressing this through training more IMETs and making them readily available um, as, as requested. What, what about the, uh, the statutory pay limits for federal workers? Is that, uh, is that a problem, a longstanding problem uh, for your agencies? Um, it's been a problem. I believe we're addressing it. Every year we, um, we work through the different processes. They've, they do get paid. Uh, but it's just that there is that when you, you hit up against it, there's, um, um, uh, Let's put it this way, there are things that happen that we have to work through. We've been more proactive with that. And I believe that we're, um, we've got a smoother process in place uh, to address it. And it's not just us, again, working as an individual agency, we have to go all the way up through top of government to deal with this issue. Of course. Um, Mr. Werner, have the pay limits presented a barrier uh, to the available I've met from your perspective? Thank you, absolutely. And I uh, we greatly appreciate uh, 
Congresswoman Lofgren for uh, introducing, I believe, a bill that's going to help our incident meteorologists. Um, the Wildfire Fair Pay Act. Because what happens is they get up to a point because they're out there so often right now because wildfires are so frequent um, that they hit a pay cap and they can no longer be deployed out there anymore. So if we get that, where we release that pay cap, uh, there are folks who are, uh, are very dedicated uh, and uh, will continue to work to support the folks out there on the fire. What other uh, obstacles are there uh, than the pay limits? Um, I think just because of the frequency, we need more IMETs and to get them trained takes time. Um, that's a big thing. And then there's also, we have a deal that we wrestle with is the pay cap for a bi-weekly pay cap where folks go out there and work on these fires and they're putting in basically 16 hour days and, um, but they don't get paid for that to maybe several pay periods later because the system doesn't react quick enough at times to go ahead and make sure that shows up in their paycheck. When it Thank should, you. Um, my time's expired. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Baird is recognized. If no, Mr. Baird, then Mr. Garcia is recognized. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Lucas uh, for this uh, uh, a very timely and excellent uh, committee hearing. And thank you to our witnesses as well. Uh, uh, Dr. Uccellini, I wanna thank you for your service uh, and your leadership over the last several years and uh, what you brought for our country. It's a national security issue as, as much as anything else. So uh, very important work you're doing, uh, that you're all doing, frankly. Uh, I do wanna to touch on something that uh, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Uh, Werner were pretty consistent about in their testimony. Uh, and specifically in their written testimony, uh, I think they were tactful about it, but they're, they're hitting at a, at a fundamental problem right now within, within the National Weather Service. Uh, and that's the, the, that's the staffing issues that they mentioned. Uh, as an appropriator, I'm looking at your budgets and I'm seeing continued growth from FY17 through FY21. So I, I don't think it's a funding problem necessarily. Uh, and I do envision certain scenarios where actually you, we, you can have increasing budgets and, and lower staff counts needed as a result of technologies evolving, efficiencies improving within, within that technology uh, coordinate system. But it looks like based on some of the written testimony we have in front of us that the, the, the staffing needs are actually validated and, and confirmed that we are well below what is absolutely necessary. Uh, and, and, I, and I do have a question about fires, wildfires, especially in the West. And I actually want to put more on your plate with regards to wildfire prediction and modeling and support of the public utility companies locally. But, but I also wanna give uh, Dr. Uccellini a, an opportunity to, to talk about what are the causal factors and potential remedies. It sounds like we all agree that the staffing issues and getting people onboarded are the long pole in the tent right now. Is it a retention problem? Is it a recruiting problem? Is it a process problem which just in the hiring process? How do, we, how do we incentivize people to stay and then come to the National Weather Service so that we can get back on step to where uh, the staffing levels are matching uh, the mission statements that we're providing you all? Okay, so, so that, that's directed towards me, Representative yes, sir. Garcia? Yes, okay, yes, just sir. want to make sure. All right, so... Um, I just want to assure everyone, and this was also reviewed by the GAO, that through our uh, new budget process that we implemented in 2015, the portfolio process, um, uh, where th there are staffing in each portfolio, but they're concentrated, the, um, the staffing for the field is concentrated in what we call analyzed forecast support, that we've been very diligent in identifying not only the needs of uh, how many people we have out there, but how do we support those people getting the job done? And that's a balancing act within the budget process. And, and the budget process involves, you know, going through the executive branch, trying to get the requirements met through that process and then bringing it to the Hill. And the final part of that, of course, is that we have to show our budget plan before any of the money is allotted. And we do list the number of FTEs. Those FTE counts are not up to um, what they uh, probably should be, okay? We have we go requirement by requirement, but mm -hmm. that's what the money will buy, okay? From an FTE count and uh, from the uh, from those process those programs and activities 
that are needed to actually support them, train them, get them the uh, the local travel um, that you know they can meet with the emergency management community at every tabletop exercise. You can just go down the list. So um, and we got reviewed by the GAO on that, and we were found um, that we do follow the amount of money allocated. We do. There's no impoundment of funds uh, from from uh, from what we would have to pay our people. Uh, but that GIO review is actually quite um, quite um, specific in terms of following the budget process, no impoundment, and and and, so, and mapping our, our so, hiring. So, doctor, not to cut you off, but I only have a I have a, only have yeah. a minute. I just want to clarify my question. Are, are are we saying then that this is actually a budgeting problem because the, the precipitous fall off in non managerials, non supervisory uh, employees chart that Dr. Warner I think presented. Uh, showed that we went from about 3,900 FTEs down to 3,300 FTEs uh, during budget increases, yet we're still understaffed. And Dr. Johnson mentioned that we, we don't have, we're, the hiring process itself is taking too long. I just want to, I just want to make sure that we're looking at this very clear eyed internally. And I'm not trying to throw spears. I'm actually trying to give more work to you all and, and put more on your plate with, with wildfires that we can talk offline about. But Internally, are you happy with the hiring processes and the ability to get the FTEs on board in a timely fashion to support your mission requirements? Yes, if I, if I may say that right now we're at 99% staffing, um, which is pretty good. Um, it, it's the highest staffing we've had since 2015, we're 150 over. Uh, our hiring rate is at 98 days. This is a tremendous improvement of where we were. Um, and um, I would say that in working with the appropriation side of the Hill, I think we have convinced them that this is a funding, there is a funding component to the issue list uh, that needs to be addressed. And the president's budget for fiscal year 22 does increase the budget in AFS, the analyzed forecast support. And um, I think there's, there's more that's gonna be needed um, as we move forward. Okay, I'll, I'm out of time, so I'll have to yield back. I will just submit uh, that the, the employee organization may uh, be inconsistent, the testimony thereof may be inconsistent with that assertion, but we can we can talk through that on the appropriation side. And, and uh, uh, Mr. Warner, if you'd like to comment, uh, I'm out of time, but uh, I can yield back, I think, uh, Chairwoman. Mr. Bowman is recognized. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know how... I think I know how Dr. Ussolini came up with the 99% uh, and what they have done is not use what was in the table of organization, which the actual GAO used. And I think they called it the organizational table uh, in their 2017 study. They didn't like uh, really the way the National Weather Service was kind of moving, moving bodies around, um, but it's not at the number. I think it's something like 4,366, which is in that organization. And for some reason, they've knocked that number down based on what they consider active positions and inactive positions. Why? Um, only they can explain, but that number is like 4,623. So uh, by the organizational table, which the GAO references in their 2017, uh, we are not at 99% staffing. Um, and so far as getting people in the organization, there are hundreds of candidates, I'm told, bidding on every position, um, just about that's out there. So there's a lot of folks who want to participate and get a chance to serve the public and try to protect lives and property um, who would just love to get into the National Weather Service. So they're out there. We just need to bring them in. Thank you, sir. I yield back. Mr. Bowman is recognized. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Uccellini, uh, thank you for your testimony and for your many years of service and congratulations on your upcoming retirement. Uh, thank you as well for highlighting the devastating impact of disasters like Hurricane Ida, which killed over 40 people in New York State and led to the destruction and flooding of homes and schools in my district. In your view, given that unprecedented events like Ida will keep happening, what specific improvements to IDSS are most imperative now that could help prevent the kind of heartbreaking loss of life and damage that we saw in New York? Well, one of the things to emphasize is that um, when a situation like this happens, uh, we, we uh, and with the emergency management community, the first responders, um, we, our job doesn't end when that, that event ends. We get back right away. Okay, what can we do better? 
um, uh, what happened on this this particular case? What are the lessons learned? We try to get that 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 turnaround rather quickly um, because you're right, it, it it can happen again. And um, I mean this, you know, Ida was an unprecedented event. It's the first time we've issued a flash flood emergency for the entire area of New York City, all five boroughs part of Nassau County to the east, part of Westchester County to the north. Um, and it's the most extensive flooding, urban flooding that New York City has experienced. So it's, you know, how do you prepare for something like that? If it's gonna happen again, when it would happen again, we got to practice, even if it's a relatively rare event now, it's a high impact event that we have to be ready for. And quite frankly, we're gonna to have to learn how to message to that in a way, uh, and and it's not just us; it's it's the whole community. How will people respond to to an event like that, right? So, um, you know, this is this is something that um, it's a continuum. It's not okay that 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 episode's over. Uh, we'll just move on to the next area that gets hit by rain. We're looking at these types of events to learn from them, from a forecast and a response perspective, and we're doing it in partnership. Uh, with the emergency management community. Thank you very much. Uh, my next question is from Mr. Salna, and it's about STEM education and climate jobs. Uh, thank you uh, for your testimony. Uh, as a former teacher and middle school principal, I appreciate your attention to community outreach and K-12 education. When we talk about green jobs, uh, weather forecasting may not be the first thing that typically comes to mind but it's a perfect example of a career path that is both intellectually stimulating and essential for our future. At the same time, as you pointed out, all of our children, tomorrow's adults, need to understand the climate crisis and they need to be able to identify and reject disinformation. I'm wondering if you can expand on your testimony to explain how the National Weather Service and other agencies can improve their own long-term capacity and effectiveness through investment in children and climate education. What kind of long-range thinking and planning do we need here so that young people are prepared for a wide range of STEM careers and to thrive on a hotter planet? Well, thank you. Well, uh, certainly it takes a team effort as I described, but on the education front, you know, one thought is, you know, when it comes to weather science and preparedness and safety uh, in the curriculums at the elementary and middle school level, there can definitely be increases so that we can get that education at that younger age, elementary, carry it to middle, then to high school. And that's so then they can get into this process of preparedness and knowing we're, you know, all about safety. And then that would then instill even more interest those, into those STEM careers and into meteorology, atmospheric science, and, and climate studies into the college level. So taking it through at a younger level and getting them educated about it and get them, getting them inspired and excited about it uh, as well. And so programs where through the Weather, Weather Ready Nation Ambassador Program, where we work for schools, in conjunction with the media and the National Weather Service, and of course, the university, where we do bring in students. We have events where we bring in students of all ages and, and uh, do weather STEM events, where we try and get very interactive, immersive, and to show them how exciting it is uh, to get into these areas, but then at the same time, show them how important it is for their future as well. Thank you so much, I yield back. Mr. Baird is recognized. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Ranking Member and all the witnesses for being here today. It's, a, it's really uh, interesting. I always learn something from these science committee meetings. But my first question, uh, um, uh, Dr. Uccellini, I really uh, respect uh, your service to our country and to the things you've done. Uh, but my first question goes to the to the idea that uh, uh, we use high performance computing, including um, our emergency capabilities to be edge to edge sensor integration and AI. Um, and do those help the National Weather Service enhance their predictions? And how does this enable communities to mitigate the impacts of more frequent severe weather events? 
So, uh, so if I may, uh, in, in answering that question, just note that there are there are really three fundamental components to making a numerical prediction system work, and making it work operationally at 99.9% reliability, which we do with the backup computer. But you have to have the computing capacity to do that. And, and historically, uh, weather prediction has been one of the main drivers for the uh, what we now call supercomputers. One of the original drivers for that back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we is still one of the main drivers for that. So you need that. Uh, we need global observations. You know, all, all I like to say all forecasts are local. You want to know what's going to happen in your backyard. They're all driven by a global observing system, even at the one day marker. So that's where the importance of the satellite coverage comes in, for example, and other um, uh, data sets is, you know, you just don't have one golden data set that can do it all. You need a collection of them. And then, then you get into the science and modeling for the data assimilation and running the models themselves and post-processing the models to extract the information from them. So those three fundamental components is what we're in the middle of. And what we're in, we're in partnership with the larger community to make all of that happen, private sector, academic communities, larger research uh, labs, other agencies, um, all of the above. With respect to the AI machine learning, it's becoming extremely important in several components of that forecast process, that model process, the post-processing and extracting the information from the observations to get into the models in a way that they can be used to enhance the predictions. So we're, we're there. Uh, we're there with that science and technology, with the benefactors of it and moving forward uh, with that. We rely on it to not only do today's forecast, but to prepare ourselves for the future. Because as you can see from this hearing, it's going to be increasing demands on what we can do uh, to serve society because the weather is getting more extreme and, um, and the climate is, is a large uh, part of that. And the vulnerability, by the way, is because we've got more people um, also living in more vulnerable areas. So all of the above uh, is contributing to these increasing needs. And the modeling uh, system, as I've just described, is going to be a key component in moving us forward. So, so continuing in that vein, um, are you or do you does your agency have access to the? Uh, the Department of Energy's supercomputers, they've got three of the five fastest, I think, in the world. So can well, you relate there to are, that? There are, okay, so there are research components of our agencies that have access to the computers, but the Department of Energy, uh, my, our, I would say our previous attempts to get some operational uh, models uh, onto their systems, um, uh, to be tested on those kinds of computers because we do go through a 10 year uh, procurement cycle uh, to um, add with three year blocks in there to, to um, try to stay on top of the computing capacity advancements and computing technology uh, that we see as we're now going uh, towards the exascale uh, type of abilities. But Department of Energy uh, doesn't lend itself to having operational models um, on their systems uh, uh, for either test or use. So um, I, would, I would like to see something done in that regard. I've, I've attempted several times in my career, uh, but I haven't crossed the finish line with that, uh, with that effort. Well, thank you very much. And uh, looks like I've got about five seconds left. I wish I had time to ask uh, questions of the other witnesses, but with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Mr. Foster is nothing nice. Well, thank you uh, to the chair and ranking member and to our witnesses. I would also like to echo my congratulations and appreciation to Dr. Uccellini for his career and service to our country. Uh, he and I are both graduates of the University of Wisconsin, which for more than a century has been guided by something called the Wisconsin idea, meaning that we should, quote, never be content until the beneficent influence of the university reaches every family in the state. As explained by Adlai Stevenson II, quote, the Wisconsin tradition meant more than a simple belief in the people. It also meant faith in the application of intelligence and reason to the problems of society. 
It meant a deep conviction that the role of government was not to stumble along like a drunkard in the dark, but to light its way with the best torches of knowledge and understanding that it can find. There really can be no better embodiment of the Wisconsin idea than Dr. Uccellini and his career. And you know, as someone who grew up in Wisconsin, I have to say that there are things going on there that I do not recognize. And they seem to be directly antithetical to the Wisconsin idea and everything it represents. But nationally, the Weather Service has itself been victimized by uninformed and politicized attacks that have nothing to do with facts, science, and logic. And that can't help with the recruitment challenges that NWS is facing. But I, I want to urge every young person with an interest in STEM to have a look at Dr. Cellini's career as an example of the good that they can do with their STEM skills to make our planet a better place. And um, now, in, in terms of, well, let's say, I'd also like to, to echo what others have said about the value of weather forecasting to keeping families safe in our districts. You know, when I was a child, someone was killed by a tornado and our family lost a sailboat stored a few miles away on Lake Mendota in, in Madison. And as a result, my mother bought a little emergency, you know, one of these little radio warning boxes. And she was always careful to test and make sure the battery was still alive on it. 30 years later, the city of Plainfield in the district that I represent in Illinois suffered one of the most devastating tornadoes on record. And this past June, DuPage County and nearby communities in the district I represent faced their most severe tornado in nearly 50 years, rated the F3 by the National Weather Service. But because the NWS was able to issue a timely warning and help local authorities prepare, not a single life was lost. The destruction and homes and businesses caused by the tornado was just devastating, but this really constitutes the success of our nation's weather forecasting systems, which exist uh, first and foremost to keep us all safe. And um, so I, I'd like actually in my questions here, if I could return a little more to the, um, to the AI, uh, the AI aspects of it. You know, there were a spate of newspaper stories about, I think it was DeepMind uh, has, you know, won some contest for getting the best performance uh, for local, um, local short-term weather forecasting. Um, and I was wondering um, if you're seeing the same trend in your supercomputing um, more toward wanting AI engines than traditional, you know, vector pipeline machines. Uh, is, are you seeing a shift in what you're going to be asking for from the next generations of these because of AI? Um, or do you end up uh, pretty much just want more of the same? Uh, well, actually, we're, we were one of the first operational units in the world to go from vector machines to parallel processing. So we've been in parallel processing mode since uh, 2001 um, and led the way uh, on that. Mm -hmm. AI, the artificial intelligence and machine learning is, is certainly something that we are paying attention to, we are involved with, and it will influence how we operate, um, I think, over the next, um, especially over the latter part of this decade in a sense that we'll be growing it, we'll be, we'll be using it, and will influence our next generation computing. Um, uh, so you've got that technology, you also have the cloud uh, technology, um, we use the system so much that we'll probably stick with an internal cloud-based system like we have now, but uh, we'll see. You know, the things are changing really fast. But from an AI machine learning perspective, uh, where uh, where um, NOAA, working through NOAA, are making um, an accelerated advances and uh, use of of that uh, type of an approach. Mm -hmm. And um, if you could. Uh recommend turning up our investment in either getting a higher data point, higher density of data points uh, you know, throughout our country and the world, or more CPU flops. Where's the highest return on investment there? Well, you only I, those three components I outlined, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And when I took over the weather service um, in 2013, we had computing capacity in which I could not transition models from, uh, from the research component of NOAA. We had models sitting for five years before I could, I could fit them onto the machine with all the other um, responsibilities we have on that machine. Um, we were way behind what the Europeans had for model capacity. It was one of the biggest issues that we faced. Uh, we're comparable now. Um, so the point is, is that if you take away from any one of those components, CPU, the science, 
the global observations, uh, it will slow down um, uh, our move forward. I, I'm sorry to say that, you know, it's, yeah, everybody wants uh, people to make a, you know, uh, a list that has uh, priorities in it, but we're only as strong as the weakest link when it comes to these modeling systems. Well, thank you for everything. And my time's up and I yield back. And thank you for your kind words. And um, I do appreciate the Wisconsin idea. Um, I was transplanted and into it from New York. That's where I grew up. But I, I certainly uh, assimilated into uh, everything I, I learned there and, uh, and taking that into uh, my dedication to public service. Ms. Weiss is recognized. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for the witnesses for being here with us today. As a lifetime resident of the great state of Oklahoma, I know a thing or two about extreme weather and the importance of immediate weather reporting. Just yesterday morning at 5 a.m., uh, we had tornadoes touch down in my district and my family was alerted um, because of the importance of the uh, things that the National Weather Service does. I recognize that weather can change with only a moment's notice, and it's important that people at NOAA have the technology available to predict and prepare for these impacts. Because of this, I recently introduced HR 5324, the NOAA Weather Radio Modernization Act, to update antiquated technology for weather radios to ensure no one is left behind during weather emergencies. Speaking of maintenance, updates for weather services and technology. The budget reconciliation, reconciliation piece that came through this committee contained $743 million for deferred maintenance for NOAA, while the administration's budget requested only $450 million. That's an obviously very large difference towards maintenance that we've heard little about. Dr. Uh, Uccellini, what are some of the National Weather Service's priorities for maintenance? And is upgrading infrastructure and facilities important or is just keeping them working and functional? Cool. Well, we have a separate portfolio for our facilities uh, for, um, you know, wh what I say houses the weather service. And it is the smallest portfolio um, uh, that we have. Um, and uh, we, you know, I, I came into a situation in which uh, maintenance was uh, at, of the facilities themselves were put on hold. And uh, we made that a priority. Um, early on, uh, the infrastructure. Um, and I would say that um, it's, still, it's still an issue. We're still catching up uh, on, the, on the facilities, but we're also trying to, you know, some of these facilities we own, some of them we rent. Uh, when the lease comes up, we're looking for opportunities to co-locate with partners. Um, and I think this is a very important uh, factor that um, we, we look at, we, we take advantage when the opportunity presents itself and we can get the, the, the uh, resources to do it, but it's proven to be a big success. So that, that's, that's one way of dealing with it, but we still have to maintain, uh, and Houston is a great example of that, by the way, and so is Albany uh, coming up in November, uh, opening up that new building that they have up there will be co-located with an emergency management college, the weather office, and right across the street from the state emergency operations center. Those are the kinds of, of things we are looking for, but we have to um, we have to deal with the maintenance of the facilities we're in today, and um, and the infrastructure for our, um, our IT and, and and dissemination program as well. So. Um, that's, that's the budget balance that we uh, are trying to work with as, uh, as we work up through the system. Um, to, to sort of add on to that, and, and let me also say my apologies to uh, Mr. Werner, Mr. Johnson, um, for, um, and Mr. Salna for focusing some of these questions uh, to Mr. Cellini um, and not giving you necessarily the time. But um, talking about the Storm Prediction Center at the National Weather Center, and the Radar Operations Center in Norman, uh, do you think that they are meeting their full operational capabilities or could they use additional maintenance and upgrades? The, uh, the, both, both units um, are I mean, really fantastic units. I mean, the, the ROC is the basis for our next RAD. Um, we do have the next RAD uh, service life extension program where at year seven of an eight year uh, on time and within budget, I just wanna emphasize that. Um, the um, really incredible upgrade to the entire system. 
um, and and they're you know fully focused on it. At the same time, we're trying to prepare for the next generation radars, and it's in that research area, which includes uh, the uh, OAR, the Oceanic and Atmospheric Research component of NOAA, that uh, we you, we need to take a look at because uh, there is an interest in accelerating our way into the new generation of uh, phased array radar systems. So um, there is that, but in terms of operating, I think we're, we're, we're really okay there. We've really advanced and, and, and sustained uh, really great work. The Storm Prediction Center um, has, um, you know, um, if their staffing is, 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 is secure. Um, they, they move forward, uh, they're there. Um, I would say that as uh, they, as the severe weather, you know, it's been a lull in the severe weather season, but we've had this great activity in the fire weather activity. They actually put the extended forecast out for uh, the atmospheric conditions for fire. There are similarities there, except the lack of moisture, of course. But the point is, is that I think there's there stress levels that are going to develop in, in that area and will have to be looked at. Great. Uh, thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Ms. Ross is recognized. Um, Thank you so much and thank you for holding this hearing, Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas. Um, and thanks to all of the panelists for joining us today for this very important discussion. My home state of North Carolina is particularly vulnerable to extreme weather like floods and hurricanes. And that's why accurate prompt weather forecasting from the National Weather Service is critical to protecting lives, personal property and our infrastructure. But as we saw with the well forecasted and yet still deadly 2011 tornado season, exceptional forecasts alone cannot protect lives. And rather it would require, as we've discussed, a whole of government approach where the National Weather Service collaborates with local officials, individuals and organizations responsible for making public safety decisions. Um, I look forward to talking about ways to increase this collaboration. And I wanna build a little bit on what Representative Bowman um, raised about inspiring the next generation of scientists and forecasters. Here in um, Raleigh, North Carolina, we have a wonderful newly renovated science museum that has the Nature Research Center that um, has a component that focuses on the weather. And it brings in school children from all over the state to have hands-on experiences. It also encourages citizen scientists. And I'd like to know from Dr. Uccellini and maybe from Mr. Salma, um, what your experiences are with citizen scientists and, the, and collaboration from the community um, to helping to um, not only publicize weather events, but also to help with public safety. Okay, I, I guess I'll go first. Um, we, um, I mean, I'm a firm believer, uh, by the way, of the STEM education um, and, and the citizen science aspect. Um, I participate in the American Meteorological Society as a past president for and now almost 25 years of uh, continuous work with their education. That's K through 12 uh, and what the weather service can bring to their programs, not only in terms of, you know, um, uh, the um, uh, from a museum point of view, but real-time data so that the folks, the kids in the classroom can start, you know, making forecasts to see whether school's going to open the next day or not, right? So, so the thing is, a uh, firm believer in that the citizen science, we have the co-op observing program, about 3,000, and it's, it's, for, it's formed the backbone of, uh, of the client, uh, you know, we have a subset of those 3,000 that, you know, provides information for the climate statistics for this country. I get the opportunity to uh, um, award um, these, uh, these, these families that have been involved in this now for 75 years, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson Award, uh, you know, 50, 75, you know, it's just incredible to see the dedication, uh, you know, all over the country, you know, of, of families that have passed this ability down so they don't lose the sight, right? because uh, climate records are really important if you can keep the site maintained right and all that. 
it's really phenomenal. And, and having those award ceremonies, we do this virtually, has actually been a real plus because you get to see the excitement of what these people bring. Um, and they still talk about their grandfathers and their great grandfathers or grandmothers who went out there in blizzards to uh, get that daily observation, right? So, so it's really uh, an amazing part of what we do. And, and we're trying to build on that because with this type of technology, you know, everybody's got observations that they want to share with us. And, um, and in real time, that can make a big difference, right? So all I'm saying is, is that um, it is a, a component that we embrace where we can, and I'm certainly a big fan of it. Great. Mr. Salna, do you have anything to add? Sure, thank you. I just want to jump on the Science Museum uh, concept, which is a big part of our team here in South Florida. So we have a big event called Eye of the Storm, and it's all about hurricane preparedness and science. And so we bring that event with all our NOAA partners, emergency management, American Red Cross, all the agencies come together in a science uh, museum environment that now brings it very interactive, very immersive, fun for the kids and moms and dads. So we bring all this content into the museum and it's been a very effective way to kick off our hurricane season here in South Florida. But the Science Museum and every community, they're the conduits of taking high level science from local university or research institutes to the community through their exhibits. And that's why we put the wall of wind exhibit there too. So we can explain the importance of wind engineering and mitigation. Thank you, and I yield back. <clears throat> Mr. Feenstra is recognized. Thank you, uh, Chairman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas, and thank you to all the witnesses for test of, uh, their testimony today and sharing extensive research and experience on these important subjects. Uh, Dr. Uccellini, um, I'm working on legislation that aims to create a research development test and evaluation program involving National Weather Service and NOAA Assistant Administrator for Oceanic and Atmospheric Research. It would focus on technology-based solutions to mitigate issues caused by radar obstruction. A key portion would involve consultation with the Interagency Council for Advancing Meteorological Services, ICAMS. The Department of Commerce, NWS, and NOAA are vital members of the council, but it also includes input from the departments and agencies. Can you elaborate on why it is so important to have Department of Transportation, Defense, Energy, and others at the table when meteor meteorological policies and practices are discussed? Well, I would say it's important in general because they're users of the information as well. Uh, and uh, as we make all of our observations and forecasts readily available. So in general, it's important to have them at the table. With respect to the radar obstruction issues, we, we track the performance of our radars every day. Uh, we, we assess uh, you know, on, a, on an annual basis with respect to obstruction issues, for example, related to growing trees, or now uh, working with the research institutes um, in some of these agencies, by the way, with respect to what's happening with the wind farms in the central part of the country that uh, actually um, has now caused an ob obstruction within the, uh, uh, the return signal uh, coming back uh, to the radars. So, so, you know, we're very, you know, these are, these are problems that are, are, are very complex. Um, so you have to, you have to go where the science is, but also deal with the folks who are in the user community that uh, have to rely on other other things like like wind energy, for example, and what that would mean. So, so we're in that we're in that mix and um, and, and attempting to work uh, with these folks who have been actually rather successful. Um, and you know we re we realize we have to uh, solve these issues. Yeah. Uh, there might come the day though that especially in some areas with trees uh, that uh, in other obstructions people build buildings that we have to move. We have to move the radar somewhere else. Uh, so uh, that's an expensive proposition, you know, uh, uh, average $10 million a pop. So we don't do that lightly, but there are those examples already uh, where it looks like the only solution set uh, when we get into this obstructed view of, is, is to move. Very rare, but it's, um, it can happen. 
Well, I, I appreciate those comments because, uh, as you noted, I live in I live in uh, Iowa, and we have a lot of wind turbines, which are fantastic, but. Uh, they do create some uh, obstacles, uh, obstructions. So last month when uh, we had Administrator Spinrod testify, I asked uh, him about the radar obstructions and technological solutions. Out of some of the possible solution I raised to him, he mentioned his fascination with phased array radar as a possible option for future uh, weather detection. Uh, it also focuses on the future legislation I'm working on. Could you explain some of the benefits of phased array radar that can complement our current radar systems? Yes, uh, so one of the major benefits is that with the way the phased array radar works, you don't have the rotating parts. Um, you don't have you know, the extent of the vertical scans, which takes all takes time to observe and then to process. Could be minutes into when we first put the next rads out. It was a five-minute period just to process all that data with these rotate. With phased array, it's out and in, right? Part of it is the real fast um, um, access to the data. Uh, you know, minutes count in a tornado warning, so there's an advantage. One of the disadvantages is that uh, one of the one of the advances we've made with the next rad is something called dual pole radar. It's not just what you're doing laterally. It's, it's, it's the vertical aspect of it, which has allowed us to um, um, see better into the clouds uh, and the structures of the, of the rain shafts, uh, the potential rotation, uh, the brief flow that actually signals a tornado on the ground can now be observed, the type of precip precipitation, the rate, the amount of precipitation falling is all enhanced with dual pole. It's not in the phased array yet. Okay, that, that's a research issue. So we have to be careful as we move forward with, with these, and, and, um, and we are. We, we, we really do believe that phased array radars is, is, is the call of the future, but we have to ensure that the uh, research and technology adds to what we can do now is not a step back from, from that. And I'm sure that the science and the technology is going to bring that answer to us, um, but we have, to, we have to go through the steps. Well, thank you so much for your comments. Thanks for all your work and each person uh, that's on uh, the test that has testified. Thank you so much. I yield back. Mr. Kasten is next. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, to, uh, to our chairman, ranking member, and uh, to our witnesses. Um, I'd like to introduce for the record a, a paper written by James Hansen and Makiko Sato this past August, July temperature update, Faustian payment comes due. Uh, if, if I could have unanimous consent on that, I'll, I'll take that as a yes. Um, the, Dr. Hansen's work is, is somewhat speculative, but he basically makes the observation in this paper that the, the, our success at reducing particulate pollution may mean that we have dramatically understated future warming, um, that we're essentially taking particulate out of the air and that has a very immediate effect on cooling. Um, even as, as reducing CO2 um, has a longer duration impact. And the kicker in his article is he says, uh, we should expect that the global warming rate for the excuse me, quarter century, 2015 to 2040, to be about double the 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade rate from 1970 to 2015. Um, that's obviously a bit of a gut punch. And uh, Dr. Uccellini, um, I don't want to confuse climate science and, and weather forecasting, but I'm but I am curious from a from a computational perspective, if in fact we are seeing a, a, a an acceleration in the rate of warming that is that quick, how much do you trust our computational tools in the weather system um, to to model scenarios that are increasingly outside of the range of data we've historically been able to check against? That's a very interesting question. Um, the, uh, the, the fact is, is that the equations we use in, in numerical weather prediction are the, basics, the basic physics and um, dynamics that are also being used in the climate uh, domain. Uh, we are accounting for um, now aerosols, um, particulate matter within these models. Um, the, 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 to get at the issues though that, um, 
uh, you're referring to, and I do have this is Jim Hansen, right? That you're yes, referring to. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I have the greatest respect for him. And um, he, he's, he was, you know, he really has a lot of foresight. So this is something really worth uh, listening to. Um, that we will need higher resolution models to effectively deal with the kinds of feedback mechanisms that he's uh, referring to. <clears throat> From a point of view of uh, a daily, weekly, and, and um, you know, out to monthly type forecast, we will need higher resolution uh, models uh, to deal with that kind of feedback mechanism. And one of the things about the warmer atmosphere that I, I'm very concerned about is that you know, we, in terms of predicting <clears throat> and even uh, determining the current precipitation rate with radars, these are based upon equations with, with uh, statistical post-processing on past events. Well, like in New York City, uh, no, you don't have any past events that, that had uh, 1.94 inches of rain in one hour that we got from Henri, and then 3.15, these are preliminary numbers, 3.15 in one hour, two weeks later, all right? So, so exactly the physics of that um, and how that's working is another part of the research equation that we're gonna have to look into. So, um, and that's for observations, for short-term forecast and for extended forecast. So um, it, it's, it's one of these uh, challenges that we're gonna have to embrace. I, I like to call it a grand challenge because it's gonna take it's going to take basically the whole community to to um, to deal with this in the weather, the water, and the um, and the climate communities uh, to collectively study these issues and um, and to allow us to make the advances on an operational uh, basis. I, I know a lot of the a lot of my colleagues have been asking you about staffing levels. Um, assume that we can solve the computational issues. Um, should we be thinking about this primarily as a, as a computational problem, or is it also a staff problem to go through and figure out, sort of ask the questions we haven't thought to ask before? Yeah, and I think this is uh, definitely relevant to the staffing um, because there's going to be increasing demands for products and information, uh, even on something like you've just brought up that perhaps doesn't have the full attention today. As we become more susceptible to some of these uh, feedback mechanisms, it's going to manifest itself in events that affect society. And once that starts happening, you're going to see the weather service right in the middle of this uh, in terms of making better forecasts, but also uh, getting that information to decision makers that could likely go beyond uh, the uh, emergency managers and water resource managers we focus on today. The public safety lens will grow. And and we'll be uh, we'll be dealing with that as well. So uh, yes, I, I think you know I'm not disagreeing that there are staffing. I wish we could get more staff, but the point is, uh, first of all, I got to live within appropriation, uh, which is uh, my first rule. And secondly, um, we have to show we have to show to um, get it to you folks uh, that this is really needed. So. But I, I'm a firm believer that uh, our services are gonna grow and it's not only gonna be us, it's gonna be the whole enterprise. I wanna again emphasize uh, what the private sector will be doing in, in this domain space as well. I think this is a growth for the entire enterprise. Well, th thank you and I appreciate the chair for letting you uh, complete your answer. I'm out of time, could continue this, but uh, yield back, but not before uh, wishing you a very happy retirement. Mr. Ailsey is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Lucas. Um, for those who don't know, uh, uh, Mike Garcia and I flew together in, uh, in the Navy in combat in 2003. So we are the end users of the product that the National Weather Service has delivered and it's, it's essential uh, to, uh, to our success. And uh, so as a former Naval aviator and a commercial airline pilot until very recently, weather forecasting has played a pr critical role in my ability to do my job and keep Americans safe. During my career, I relied on data provided from the NWS and its forecasters, and I'm forever grateful to these men and women who work around the clock to deliver accurate and reliable data. The National Weather Service is instrumental in our ability to protect property, save lives, and enhance our national economy, not to mention our security. After hearing and reading your testimonies, I believe that Congress must equip 
the organization with tools to better forecast weather events and communicate those findings with the general public. And I'd like to also point out that uh, Chairwoman Johnson and I back in uh, December 26th of uh, 2015 were hit with a uh, massive tornado since we're in the middle of Tornado Alley that literally jumped over my house and led me to install. While I was on a trip in Los Angeles as an airline pilot, my family was hiding in the closet and uh, spurred me to, to invest in a, in a uh, uh, tornado shelter at our home. Um, so this problem isn't going away. It's, 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 it's extremely important as an, and also as an, a former airline pilot for a company that recently this last weekend had some issues both with weather and manning. Uh, I'd like to address this to Mr. Warner uh, since the management and labor issue has always existed. There's always a tug of war between the two. You've identified a problem that you are, that in your mind, uh, you're understaffed and that the GS construct with your, with your work group uh, isn't helpful uh, if, if I'm wrong there, please expound on that. And what are your solutions to getting the staffing up to the requirement that you need? Thank you. I didn't quite catch the last part of that question. The, uh, the GS construct. GS five through 12. Uh, I mean, it's, I, I think, I think you said that that's not working in the way it was intended. Second, third order effects rarely do. So I just, I just like your thoughts on it. Yeah, I think I think with regards to staffing, let me start out with this: is that uh, we firmly, totally embraced impact-based decision support services. Let's just forget about the numbers, but we've been operating in that mode continuously for uh, a number of years now, and we keep talking about possible unlocks to free up time. We haven't really fully realized those because things are still in the process of being developed, being tested out. What will work? Won't will work? There are hypotheses what will come, but there are increasing, increasing demands on the service that we provide. And that's great because you know what? We realize at the local level that they really, really add a benefit because most of the key decisions are actually at the local level with the emergency managers and the public health officials because they are the ones that make the decisions that actually wind up protecting the community. So we're fully, fully invested in that. And I see the strain out there. I see lack of personnel and offices. I see people who have worked over the last five years, 500 hours, and I've even been told up to a thousand hours of overtime in one year. That's not sustainable. We've actually created new capabilities at the Hurricane Center. We made um, operational the uh, storm surge unit there with two federal employees. It became operational. And last year during our busiest, uh, most active hurricane season ever, these two folks during the pandemic put in over 500 hours of extra time to support the mission. Thank goodness nobody caught COVID. So this is this is real that this is going on. Now, so far as the five to 12 construct, that's a concept where the whole focus, and it shouldn't be the whole focus, is bringing bodies in, but we also need experience, right? I was alerted not long ago of an office that had, um, out of their staffing of eight meteorologists, they were down three. Okay, so they only had five now. And of those five, so following hitting the full proficiency of the GS-12 level, I think there was only one, maybe two, was at that level. And normally an office at least has a lead forecaster, somebody who's a GS-12 who's proficient, and maybe another forecaster there. So that puts a burden on that office to provide the increased products and services to get that out. So we need to step back and go, wait a minute. When we see offices that do not have this experience, we need to stop. We need to go ahead and put out an announcement to allow 11 or 12 to move there or do a lateral transfer prior to opening up this mass vacancy. You can do them in steps. So you're still filling the seats, uh, but also giving people an opportunity to move. And there is frustration out there. I, I spoke about this in the paper where prior to this five through 12 construct, we had another construct where we had people that reached the, the grade of an 11 an internship and they normally have two, three years under their belt. And then they would apply for the journey position as a 12. But when this started, they got shut out. So they have people who went ahead and worked the research in convective weather. And there's some place where they don't have convective weather. Talk okay. about taking research to operations and tropical weather as well. So they're frustrated and they're moving out. So people are leaving okay. the seats. We can keep in. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Mr. Warner. Mr. Uccellini, sorry we didn't get to you. My time is up. I yield back and happy retirement, Mr. Uccellini. Thank you for your years of service. Thank you. Ms. Wild is recognized. 
Thank you very much. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. My district is Pennsylvania's seventh district located squarely in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania. For those of you who know Pennsylvania geography at the Allentown Bethlehem Easton area. Um, we recently experienced a rash of flooding and damaged infrastructure as the aftermath of Hurricane Ida tore through our community. We had flooded roads, strong winds, lack of power and serious debris that made it very difficult for businesses to reopen, for people to get to work and to school, and for the first responders to get to those who were in need after the storm. I appreciate each of your testimony so far on how we can make our country a weather ready nation. And I believe one key part of this aim is ensuring that extreme weather and disaster warnings are accessible and understandable to stakeholders and to the public in the face of such events. And I know that all of you have talked about that to some extent. Um, in addition to emergency managers and first responders, key service providers like our transit systems, healthcare systems, and schools need timely and accurate information to prepare for and, of course, to respond to disasters. And in preparing their families and their homes for storms and floods, the general public needs quick access to well contextualized information on the timing location and severity of extreme weather risks. I have a constituent organization in my district, the Nurture Nature Center in Easton, Pennsylvania, that is working to answer these questions through social and behavioral research. And the group has received um, NOAA grants among other agencies. This research can help inform how all levels of government can make disaster and extreme weather planning, communication and management meet the needs of the public and fulfill the mission that Congress laid out um, of protecting lives, property, and the national economy in the Weather Research Act of 2017. So with all of that said, I'd like to start Dr. Uccellini. Um, could you discuss how the um, National Weather Service uses social and behavioral science research to strengthen its impact-based decision support services for community and emergency management partners? Oh, thank you. Yes, uh, with um, our, our going beyond the forecast, the warning to interact with directly with decision making and influence that uh, comes the uh, recognition that we're now entering the field of social science um, and dealing with, um, you know, exactly how to message to uh, get the best response, how to design products and services that map into specific uh, key decision points how to deal with the, um, the changing risk preference that people have, um, even as you're going through a forecast from 10 days out to the actual event, uh, people have different risk preferences um, uh, and, and the, even the emergency management community will have a different tempo uh, as you approach an event. So everything is affected from a human factors perspective. Uh, so uh, we are, do have now, um, at we, we um, we partner with other agencies. We, we partner with uh, line offices within NOAA to leverage uh, off of their uh, social science research. We have a small amount of work that's actually done in the weather service that's more focused on the products and services and assessing our messaging and et cetera, et cetera. And, and we've already gotten feedback about simplifying our messaging through that, that activity that we're gonna be implementing over the next one or two years. So. Um, this is becoming increasingly a bigger part of what we do and what we need. Uh, and certainly with the organization that you referenced, there's work that's done that's focused on how to respond to water events, which is different, you know, than, than weather events, quite frankly. There are different aspects to it. So um, it's been very helpful to us, and it certainly has uh, been a part of the successes we have seen to date, but we certainly have a much longer way to go uh, in, that, in that area. Thank you. And I'm going to just shift gears because we, as you know, have very limited time and ask Mr. Warner, um, based on your experience and your members feedback, what types of training, professional development and other resources can help support the employee pipeline, especially for new hires and young professionals at the weather service? I think, um, well, Basically, it requires a degree in meteorology to become a meteorologist. Um, we also have folks who are interested in hydrology. That's another interest that we take in. 
Um, we also have folks who are uh, electronic technicians that come in as well. Um, we also have physical scientists. I think the big thing that we really need to do is go out there and actually sell ourselves, go to these schools um, and uh, actually show them what a career in the National Weather Service is all about. And we do that a lot sometimes at the, at the local offices or we did prior to the pandemic. We'd go to high schools, we'd go to colleges and you know, what, what, what does it take to get into this career? What do we do? or come out to the office and participate in the forecast, look through this uh, weather radar scenario. What interests you in this? What, and what are the requirements to get, get there, which we don't set, but they're already laid out. And, and, and how do you go about doing that? Did, did I answer your question on that? Thank you. It's, a, it, it's probably an open-ended question that we could talk about all afternoon, but I okay. thank you very much for your input. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Ms. Kim is recognized. Ms. Kim, if you're ready, you're recognized. Hmm. Okay, I don't think we have Ms. Kim available now. Uh, we'll go with Ms. Stans. We'll give Ms. Kim one last second, Ms. Kim. Okay, if Ms. Kim is not prepared, then we'll go with Ms. Stansberry. Thank you so much. And thank you, Madam Chair, for convening today's important panel. And thank you to Mr. Uche Lely you, um, for your service uh, for so many years with the Weather Service. I'm sorry, I just mispronounced your name. Uche um, As we all know, our communities are already experiencing the impacts of climate change, as many have said today, and extreme weather events. And these events are becoming more frequent all across the country, including in my home state here in New Mexico. And the National Weather Service plays such a pivotal role, not just in weather forecasting, but increasingly in climate forecasting. And in, in order to enable our communities to plan for and to respond to these events and a changing climate, it is so vital that we are able to accurately model and develop tools and technologies and to really translate and deliver that information to our communities so that it can inform their decision making on the ground. So this includes both responding to emergency situations as we've talked so much about this morning, but also planning for and building a more resilient and sustainable infrastructure and future for our communities. So to do that, our communities and our federal partners really need resources to ensure that all parts of our country, including my home state, have sufficient staffing, technology, funding, et cetera, for real-time observations, for forecasting, for place-based tools, and to provide that on the ground technical assistance. And I think like so many parts of the country, this year has really punctuated the need for those investments in New Mexico, where we have been simultaneously grappling with one of the most severe droughts in our history at the same time that we've experienced the highest number of disaster declarations ever in our state's history due to flooding and to wildfires. So we are very much appreciative to the National Weather Service, who has been a fantastic partner in New Mexico and provides, of course, regular briefings to our state and to our local partners through the drought monitor monitoring work group and all of the services that you all provide. But New Mexico needs more support. We need more observational platforms, including things like dense mesonets for improving near-term and short-term forecasts um, to help support our public safety and decision support. We don't have enough monitoring systems and we really have severe limitations in our local weather forecasting. We also need more support for real-time precipitation and flood alert systems, especially in our urban areas, which are experiencing more severe weather incidents. And just as we've been talking about all, all morning, we are also facing staffing shortages locally, which impact our forecasts and drive talent to burn out quickly and leave the field. Um, you know, the National Weather Service does perform outreach to our communities and to our schools, but there's so much more that we need to do to create a strong STEM pipeline so that New Mexicans can also take, a, take part in forecasting our future. 
here in our state, we are home to communities that have lived on these lands for centuries and since time immemorial. And our communities are experiencing and seeing climate change before our very eyes. And we need to make sure that they have the opportunity to not only have a seat at the table, but also to build that robust STEM workforce across our communities. So we see that as being part and parcel of building our STEM workforce through our public universities, our minority serving institutions, our tribal colleges and also partnerships with our two national labs who are themselves at the forefront of climate science and modeling. And so I urge all of our federal agencies, including the Weather Service and NOAA at large, to look at expanding programs in New Mexico and particularly at our minority serving institutions and to really partner to build that pipeline in communities. So I look forward to working and supporting NOAA and the Weather Service and our committee's work on these issues. And we know how critically important our weather and climate forecasting capabilities are to the future, the safety, security, and well-being of our communities. So with that, Mr. Um, Uccellini, I would like to just ask a couple of quick questions. You know, one of the big challenges from a science perspective is how to make that translational leap between weather and climate forecasting so that we can close the gap. Admiral, thank you so much. Okay, I, I will try to come back. Thank you. Um, to help our communities prepare and plan for the impacts of climate change, especially with extreme weather events. And uh, what I wanted to ask you this morning is how can we help support the scientific and technical technological advances that are needed to close that gap between weather and climate forecasting? And how can we here in Congress help to support that work at the Weather Service? Well, we, uh, we clearly need support in that the weather climate, I would say the weather water climate linkage is, is, is um, is something that's being recognized um, as a fundamental um, issue that we need to um, build off of and, and address. Um, the, um, uh, you can't make advances in the weather uh, domain space or the water domain space or the separate climate domain space without the interactions amongst all of them. And this is something that we're, we're really promoting um, as a basis for moving forward. And it certainly applies to the Southwest in the monsoon, whether you get it or not, I know it's a big deal out there. That's that's a that's a forecast uh, a year in advance, six months in advance, three months in advance that people plan around, and that's a big challenge. I, we understand that, um, so it's it's something that we absolutely need to do. I also think, in terms of getting it to your users, we we really have shown success in our partnership. Uh, with tribal nations across the country. And that's a success, again, built on a trusted relationship among, among the Weather Service uh, personnel and the tribal, ne uh, tribal leaders um, and, 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 um, and the people there out there. So uh, we're really proud of that. Again, it's something we, we need to build off of um, because um, all, all the things you've just mentioned, those threats are, are multiplied when you get into the tribal domains or the poor areas in any state, uh, the, uh, the impacts are, are amplified. So uh, this is something that's certainly um, uh, on, in our planning uh, to, uh, to deal with more uh, as effectively as we can. Let's just put it that way. Thank you. And I know I'm out of time here, but we very much look forward to working with the Weather Service. And I very much hope as you all are moving forward and doing your planning for staffing and addressing many of the management and and the staffing issues that have been discussed this morning, that you will lean into partnering with minority serving institutions to build that pipeline, because that's the future, not only of our communities, but I think really the future of federal service. So I wanna thank you all and um, appreciate you being here this morning. Thank you. Ms. Kim is recognized. Well, thank you very much, Chairman. And I would like to thank our ranking member uh, for holding this timely hearing. Actually, um, tomorrow I will be preparing to uh, host a wildfire roundtable discussion. Um, so this, uh, you know, is very timely for me. And uh, at our uh, wildfire roundtable discussion tomorrow, we're looking to find uh, cooperation, uh, the system between federal, state, and local stakeholders and um, see how we can alert and predict 
mechanisms of water files and emergency response and public safety. So I really appreciate the conversation today. Uh, I represent California's 39th congressional district. And my district is in Southern California where the air quality is infamously poor due to smog and wildfire smog during the wildfire season. Um, as a result, as you can see, the individuals with heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, as well as uh, children, the elderly and pregnant women in my district are at risk of these uh, health complications due to poor air quality during wildfire season. So it's really important that we discuss the accurately forecasting wildfire smoke because it's not only an environmental issue, but also an issue of public health. So uh, Dr. Um, Ussolini, uh, the question for you is, what is the current state of our ability to predict smoke output and transport from a wildfire? And what questions uh, do we need to answer in order to improve smoke forecast models? And what do an Im improved smoke forecast mean with regard to public health and safety? So it's a very important part of the health equation with respect to fires is, is the smoke. Uh, we have a number of models now that actually deal with particulate matter um, and, and smoke directly uh, and a very high resolution model, which has been implemented over the, over the past uh, several years is actually uh, what, is, what we've seen on the output uh, from those models are seen on TV um, in terms of the movement of the smoke. I would also say that we've made uh, great advancements in a satellite program. This is um, uh, this the satellite component of NOAA, uh, NESDIS, um, and in the launch of these um, uh, geostationary satellites with high resolution ad advanced baseline imagers. I mean, the smoke uh, observations that, that come from them with the incredibly high resolution um, is just been, has been uh, phenomenal actually. And another aspect of those is being able to spot the fires. It's, it's become one of the earliest indicators that you got a fire in your neighborhood is what we're seeing on one of these uh, ghost uh, um, images. So, you know, we're, we're there um, in providing the observations uh, with air quality forecast. Um, I would, I should note that we, whatever we produce, we, we, we provide to the states and the local communities that actually make the air quality assessments and, and, and related uh, uh, predictions. So, um, but we, we do have the tools and uh, improved tools to get to them. Um, are they good enough from the health vector perspective? Uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. It's probably uh, another basis for an extensive research effort to be able to have the um, more exact quantification of the smoke, the nature of the smoke, the size of the particles, et cetera, um, to be able to relate those to health. But that's certainly uh, uh, an interest uh, in the um, in the larger community, the medical community, in terms of what can be done uh, to assess locally, and then use the predictions to assess what's going to be happening downstream uh, from those fires. So, would you say? I mean, or can I ask you, very frankly, how do you think we? I mean, how accurate are the uh, National Weather Service's smoke forecasts? Um, <laughs> You know, we we are doing assessment. Actually, the uh, the uh, forecast for the particulate matter and smoke is 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 relatively good. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but um, it's um, you know they're as good as the basically the dynamics in the in the flow field in the atmosphere uh, that moves moves those uh, uh, the smoke and particulate matters will make it, and it's actually um, been pretty remarkable. Um, I, I would I would say it was. I've been one of the main proponents when I was the head of uh, the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. We actually introduced these models working with EPA and then and with the research component of NOAA, which is out in Boulder, uh, producing the higher resolution versions. Um, I, you know, I think it's a, it's a pretty good product already, but like every other forecast system, they always have areas that need to be improved. I can't articulate them for you right now, but I can guarantee you that there's there are researchers out in Boulder, Colorado, who could. Thank you. Gosh, I see that my time is up, but uh, I wanted to talk about the, the next generation of meteorologists and scientists because my home state's economy is heavily rely on large STEM workforce in many different sectors. So 
gosh, I but I am out of town. Chairwoman, do you have, would you allow me maybe a time to ask one more question regarding this? I mean, if we have a second round, we'll come back. Okay. Well, thank you. Then I'll yield back. Mr. Tonko's recognized. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Chair Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas for offering this stage of uh, for discussion on what is a very important uh, uh, role that uh, and you know the uh, Weather Service plays in in our country's uh, uh, security. Uh, and so I thank you for that, and I thank the witnesses for uh, offering uh, information to us today, which is uh, very uh, important as we go forward. Uh, before I begin. I acknowledge Dr. Uccellini's 43 year career in public service, as well as his nine years of leadership at the helm of the National Weather Service. Um, doctor, you dedicated over 50 years of your life to the field of meteorology and therefore are leaving a legacy uh, that will have a lasting influence for generations. So I did indeed wish you the best. And uh, for you and the team at NWS, Thank you for your reliance on and your respect for science, uh, as it is indeed critical as this nation addresses its national security and its uh, uh, response to the challenge of climate, climate change. Um, for many years, I've been deeply concerned about several matters within the NWS, but specifically workforce issues and the reorganization of the National Weather Service forecast offices. Um, I greatly appreciate the incredible and essential work that the NWS does. However, I have remained concerned for some time about the number of vacancies and hiring backlogs uh, at the Weather Service. In the 2017 GO, a, GAO report, some Weather Service staff said that because positions remain vacant for extended periods, they were concerned that the agency might be intentionally leaving vacant positions open to downsize the number of staff across operational units so Dr. Uccellini, does the National Weather Service indeed intend to uh, downsize? No. Okay, in fiscal year 2016, the Weather Service's vacancy rate at its operational units was 11%. What is the current vacancy rate both funded and uh, with both funded and unfunded vacancies? I, I can say I, I have the number with respect to what we're um, appropriated for and what's in our spend plan that was been vetted with uh, Congress as, as the money was being allotted, that um, we are up to about 99% uh, now with the baseline um, uh, being what's, uh, what's in the appropriation bill, not, not the table of organization, which dates back to 2000. So um, I, I, if, if you allow me, I, can, I would like to just say that, um, oh, I would say it's been since 2017 that we finally, all the, all the stars lined up with respect to the processes, or the hiring processes being, um, uh, uh, being improved uh, within NOAA and uh, within the Weather Service um, and, and, and um, being able to use programs like five through 12 to get more people into the weather service. We're 150, we, we have 150 more people in the weather service today than we had in 2017. Um, this is uh, related uh, principally to uh, the entry level coming through the five through 12 program, right? Mobilization, okay. mobilization doesn't change the bottom line. It moves holes from one office to another. Okay. What we want is a staffing that can do the job, and we're working hard to get that. And I appreciate that. And, you know, Mr. Warner, you've opined that there, in your opinion, are vacant positions. And how, if that is the case, how would that impact the Weather Service's delivery of accurate forecasts and the IDSS? Well, it stresses the staff, but I think the big thing is, is there we wind up having to limit what we can take on so far as impact-based decision support services. And what is frustrating, if you're going for a time and you have a partnership where you're providing these services, there's an expectation. It's a partnership. And then all of a sudden you're short-staffed two or three bodies and 
you no longer have the critical mass to do that. You have to pull back. That's to me, as, as it makes us look poorly as a partner when we're really trying to build relationships and better serve the community. Okay. Uh, the 2021 GAO report that I co-requested with Chair Johnson, uh, Representatives Christ and Bonamici recommended that the National Weather Service develop a two-way communication strategy for the Evolve program that outlines how the agency will listen and respond to employee concerns. The report mentioned the National Weather Service had started working on a strategy in 2019. So Dr. Uccellini, when will this communication strategy be finalized and released? Who is developing it? And will it have buy-in from both employees and union members? So, so the, um, uh, the, the strategy aspect is, uh, well, first of all, since 2019, uh, we, we now have a, a CBA that, and I thank John Werner and his leadership um, on, the, uh, on the union side, um, and, and Mary Erickson, uh, who is the deputy director of the Weather Service, uh, really got together and, uh, and pulled that together. Um, part of the strategy is, is you know, is, is, is wrapped up in, in that we do invite new ECO uh, to the table um, as, we, uh, as we move forward. Um, there, are, there are times though that, that there's certainly um, a, a not agreement and we are attempting to work that through like, it, like right now um, in the collaborative forecast process. There are, uh, there are discussions going on uh, between uh, the folks in the PMO and, and the union uh, to bring this forward. So it's, it's something that uh, we're, we're working on. Uh, part of this is, uh, involves the uh, staffing plan uh, that uh, would, would, would come out of, of you know, trying to address the increasing demand signal that, that John has rightfully pointed to, by the way. Um, we're, we're certainly in solid agreement on that. Uh, the question is, how do, we, how do we get that to the point where that can be funded along with everything else we have to do. So I just want to assure you that we're working on these plans. We're, we're working to advance ourselves and to advance our staffing issues uh, uh, within the budgets uh, that we are appropriated. Thank you. Madam Chair, I had two other questions that I wanted to ask of uh, both Dr. Uccellini and Mr. Warner. I'll get those to the committee in writing and, and will in advance thank the two gentlemen for their responses. So with that, Madam Chair, I yield back and again, thank you. I'm sorry we ran over time. Thank you. Mr. Byers recognized. Thank you very much. And Madam Chair, thank you so much for putting this on. Dr. Uccellini, let me add my congratulations. And I hope you uh, have lots of plans for your retirement. Uh, and Dr. Uccellini, especially because I'd love to know what you and the Weather Service are preparing for in terms of the critical weather events in the years to come. You know, the global service temperature has risen 1.1 degrees centigrade compared to the years 1850 to 1900. This is from the IPC report. The last time the Earth's surface was this warm was 125,000 years ago. But that's not the bad news. The bad news is the IPCC now, their best estimate is three degrees centigrade. So that's another 1.9 or almost two full degrees centigrade from where we are right now with all of the things we have heard in the last two hours from my fellow members of Congress. That range is two and a half to 2.5 to 4.0 degrees centigrade. Uh, and it will break the 1.5 mark, which was the Paris thing sometime between 2025 and 2037. So what can the National Weather Service do now to get ready for ever more dramatic weather events, ever more um, dr dramatic um, changes in the ability to forecast what's coming? Well, I, I can say that we are certainly aware of the increasing um, vulnerability. I, I, I would call it increasing vulnerability that our communities are facing with respect to these extreme events, uh, whether it's the coastline, uh, winter storms, uh, hurricanes, um, whether it's inland with droughts, the flash droughts uh, that are now becoming more prevalent in the Northern Midwest, uh, the heat. I mean, you know, we, we talked about Northwest part of this country. There were heat 
um, uh, events this year that rival the records that uh, are the, the that you see in Phoenix. Okay, um, it's it's really it's it's really stark. And of course, the fire uh, the fires are burning faster and hotter, um, and um, in, impacting society. So we we are trying to step up our game with respect to um, the ability to forecast the extre extremity of these events, which will, will likely grow. Um, to deal with the vulnerability of the communities, we have to work in partnerships. This is, this is really the key to Weather Ready Nation is, is that those public safety officials, the uh, emergency management, the water resource management. And one of the things we recognize, and this gets back to John's concern, John Warner's concerns, most of the decisions on public safety in this country are made at the local levels. All right, the Tocqueville discovered that in 1835, published it in 1838, and it's still true today. So we have to provide this consistent and accurate information to all government levels, but it's, it's the local presence that's gonna be put under extra stress uh, in terms of dealing with this, whether it's us making the forecast and warnings over extended period of time, or the public safety officials that are out there on the ground evacuating people or dealing with the community issues to, to react. So that, all of the thanks. above, we're all going to be challenged. Thank you, Dr. Julian. Let, let me pivot. Mr. Warner, we talked about the 500 vacancies and there's some, some ambiguity of how much there is, but why 98 days? You know, I'm a private sector guy and I can't imagine taking 98 days to hire anybody. You know, the background check can be done in two days check the references in five days. Mr. Werner, your You're asking me that? I don't know why it takes that long. <laughs> Apparently, no. uh, it's, it's actually supposedly from what I've been told is sped up somewhat. Yeah, um, yeah. I have no idea. I think our system was broken. and They're trying to get it better. Um, I have no idea why it takes that long. I think it should be a lot quicker than that. And there is also another mechanism we could use with doing lateral assignments prior to doing the external mass hirings. Uh, it's called the uh, NOAA Reassignment Opportunity Notice that gets people in a lot quicker because they're already status employees that take care of that experience gap and then do the external mass hirings to fill in those seats. But why those are gonna take 90 to 98 days, I have no idea. So Dr. Uccinelli, I know it's better, but why is it still so long? Well, you know, this is a process that involves the 98 days is uh, getting the announcement out, um, you know, getting people to apply, getting it reviewed, right? Uh, going, through the, going through that process uh, takes um, a month or two, and then actually getting people to, um, you know, they apply, but they don't necessarily agree right away. Then you got to go through the security checks. The security checks have gotten actually a lot better. That used to be the tall pole in the tent, and we've, we've worked that. That's point one. Point two is with respect to high, and there's so many resources that you have in the human human resource area that uh, it's not just the problem in the weather service, it's problem throughout NOAA. I, I don't have a hiring component within the weather service. I have to rely on NOAA um, and they're improving uh, tremendously. So um, we got to work work through that, um, but we're 98 days is, uh, is a, uh, is, is a marked improvement over uh, where we were before. And I would also say that there are people who get that hiring thing or in school that need another month. That all adds up to the average time of when you actually fill the seat. So, um, but that's, uh, let me assure you that uh, we're not the private sector that's able to, to do that, but we are finding ways to, to, um, to accelerate where we can. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, I'll go shield back. Uh, Chairwoman Johnson, uh, all of the members have asked questions, and I think you can close out the hearing whenever you're ready. Uh, to the staff, do we have time for a second round? Uh, that's entirely up to you, Madam Chair. <laughs> well, let me just uh, suggest perhaps that those who had questions, I know that one of the members already said that if they would I only heard maybe two that needed other time, uh, if you will submit your questions to the committee, 
we will then submit them to the witnesses. And let me say thank you to all of our witnesses. This has been a very dynamic uh, hearing and I appreciate you spending your time with us. Uh, before we bring the hearing to a close, uh, I wanna make sure that every single witness receives a very hearty thank you and appreciate the knowledge you've shared. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements for members and for any additional questions the committee may ask the witnesses. So our witnesses are now dismissed and our committee hearing is closed.